All right, guys, we're doing the five, four, three, two, one, making sure we're live. Give me one second, and then we'll get to chatting. Can you see me? Give me a shout out. Looks like we're live on Facebook. And what about YouTube? It's looking good. Okay. All right, then. Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Wine Wednesday. Cheers to you. I hope your week was fabulous. Your seahorses and reef tanks are doing great. And, of course, you know, I'm the Seahorse Whisperer. I already got Seahorse Source, Dan, Holly, Ray, and Marina with me to talk this week's topic. Talk, talk this week. To talk about this week's topic, which is cleanup crew. It was the most requested on the poll that we did. Thank you so much to everybody who participated. Just a shout out to, to Cheap Wines, Barefoot, Chardonnay, rocks it really does the the vanilla hinty smell and flavors are wonderful okay so i'm not a connoisseur but definitely want to know what you're drinking in the comment section and i hope you brought lots of questions but let's start it off hello everyone that's joined tonight how are you all doing great i always get like one response it's so great <laughs> <laughs> marina how are you good good all right, well, I know that you messaged me earlier and said what a perfect follow-up topic for from last week's uh, topic, which was Tank Mates 2, because we've done that before, but we got into a little more detail. And she was really excited that we were going to follow it up with this, with this, um, blah, 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 already tongue-tied, with this topic. And I know that certain people had um, very good questions. So if you join and have questions, get on that comment section and let us know. Um, and I told Marina also that I'm not great with this topic because you guys know, I say it in every stream, I'm a snail girl. <laughs> I, like, I like the snails. And at the end of this stream, I will tag in my usual which snail eats what uh, article that I love that's really old, but it's great. Um, but anyways, I'm, I'm rambling on and on, so let's just let's just jump right in. Dan, what's the difference between like um, a system that you would set up with no cleanup crew and a hobbyist setup? What do you tell people when they ask? Well, I do <clears throat> my cleanup crew with the fry is the my, live mycids. Um, but when I when I tell people, I usually recommend the saria snails, peppermint shrimp, and um, um, hermit crabs primarily hermit crabs snails i'm sorry or and how to tell tell everyone really quickly i know you told us before but what do you mean by you use the shrimp as a cleanup crew in a fry tank well live mycids uh eat the same food as as the uh, our uh baby fry do the um seahorse fry and that when I put them in the tank, the bottom is much cleaner because they're scavengers. It doesn't have to be swimming around. So they're cleaning up part of the poop, which has some of the organic matter left over. And they're also cleaning up, you know, dead Artemia or Artemia that are just on the bottom. Gotcha. Sorry, I, I hit a wrong button. Sorry, guys. That, that My face about that was not his answer. It was because I hit the wrong button. <laughs> um, so if it goes a little slow for a second, I'm going to close that in just a second. Sorry. Um, but yeah, right. Exactly. I think Lucy does that too. Something like that. She uses a bunch of shrimp that she, and she uses it in a larger tank too. She uses shrimp that um, she hopes the seahorse won't eat. They usually do, um, but it makes sense. Uh, and good to know what you tell a hobbyist because obviously it is a different system and i've always been you know kind of of the thought that your cleanup crew depends on what how much work you want to do you know like i know people want to know what to use for cleanup crew but you could do a tank with very little cleanup crew as long as you're willing to do the extra work do you agree ray or not um i think you probably uh may have forgotten i don't use a cleanup crew right that's why i asked you <laughs> well i must i was typing when you were uh, asking the question so i guess i missed that okay i'll repeat it again it's no big deal i was I guess, making um, go ahead marina I guess, I guess ray you are the cleanup crew because <laughs> yeah. i clean out the tank every 10 days well except for right now it's way overdue now because i've got some severe back problems and haven't been able to do it. 
Well, and uh, I know what it's going to boil down to. Uh, if worse comes to worse tomorrow, I'll just have to do a water change and not do any tank cleaning. Sure. Well, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'd like to ask you, Dan. So if you're using live mice for a cleanup crew and your fry tank, does that mean they'll also kind of perhaps hopefully start learning how to eat those as they grow? Well, the process, what I do is I inoculate the tank with a handful of live mycids in the beginning. Now, remember, I'm using a 48-inch round tank. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of surface area. It's round. It's hard for the, the fry to get to them. And what happens is because there's such an abundance of food and there's so much room, that population rapidly expands. And as they have nauplii, the fry can pick at the nauplii from the mycids. And uh -huh. over time, as they get bigger and bigger, they'll start going for the adult mycids. And it's kind of and fun to watch because you'll see the, the population start shrinking. And when it starts shrinking, it's time to start introducing frozen mices. But there's yeah. always a, you know one or two mycids that just seem to be you know, able to evade the seahorses. And they're, they're running helter-skelter around that tank trying to dodge yeah. 500 fry. You know, Very it's, cool. it's hilarious to watch. Um, somebody asked a question about... Um, Dwarfs. Dwarf seahorses, mm -hmm. and I used I used uh, live mice with the dwarfs as well. So it works for dwarfs too. Great, thank you. I was gonna. Uh, I want to say hi to D from Brooklyn. I want to say hi to everybody on Facebook. Mermaids Reef, thanks for joining us, everybody. If you have an off the top question, off, <laughs> off the topic question, feel free to ask because you know we're gonna cover cleanup crew. But because I posted so late, this is kind of like an open chat. So feel free. If we don't get right to it, I promise by the end we will. Um, and I'll try to put timestamps in later. Um, but thank you for covering the question about the dwarf seahorses because we do need to talk about that because are there some things that you could use in a cleanup crew in a regular seahorse tank that you can't in a dwarf? Or, I mean, would you say everything? <laughs> I would be real careful because a lot of those, you know, the dwarfs are small enough that it's like having fry and most things will go after them. Um, I'd be real afraid of putting hermit crabs in there um if you had you know when the dwarfs have fry they're really susceptible the fry especially susceptible to the cleanup crew being um if they're hungry going after them gotcha absolutely um agreed um so okay well let's let's go through the people here first holly so what what is your cleanup crew in your seahorse tanks I have a variety of hermit crabs. I have two emerald crabs. I have a lot of different snails, and I have a peppermint shrimp, and a, um, I guess the goby you could consider part of the cleanup crew, too, because he does eat what the seahorses don't. <laughs> Right. Hey, gotcha, guys, uh, anybody in the audience as you're watching this, I know it's uh, doing a little freezing and that's because I accidentally clicked the wrong button and opened another program that made my computer go, what? So that should uh, catch up now, hopefully, because I've turned that off. Um, but if you have a hard time hearing them or anything like that, please give me a shout out really quickly. Um, hey, I'm jumping through comments, of course, and I want to get to the other people, but D from Brooklyn said he loves his sea urchins. Who says yay or nay to a seahorse tank with sea urchins? Sounds too sharp to me. Well, I've seen it done successfully. Um, I'm hesitant to do it, but I have seen it done. I think part of it depends upon the type of urchin. Um, we collected an urchin locally. I have no clue what species it was. And we put that in a seahorse tank and it did fine. Um, some of them have really sharp, long spikes, and I'd be hesitant with those, but, um, you know, it depends upon your risk tolerance. If you're willing to try it, you know, I'm not opposed to giving it a shot. Yeah, and that's a, and that's a really good point, um, because I know Dee and Ryan are both planning to try seahorse tanks, and they, and I know at least Ryan will go all out and, like, soup it up and have all of this equipment extra equipment that you know not everybody uses and he'll give them the space he'll follow the rules it'll be great so will d i'm sure <laughs> um and hates everybody joining but 
when you add all of that stuff, is a cleanup crew as necessary? Or are you getting into the area where you're more like Dan Systems? What do you think? I don't know. I think if it's set up as a display tank and you've got sand and rock, I think a cleanup crew is warranted because unlike a bare bottom uh, production system, there's all kinds of places for stuff to hide. and it's, you, You're not going to want to siphon out sand every day. Yep, and we got to go through that too. But really quick, I'm jumping around. Sorry, guys. Uh, Marina, what is your cleanup crew? Um, I have a bit of a variety. Um, I love snails. Snails are definitely my favorite. Um, so I have trochus snails, turbo snails, and nerites for cleaning algae. Um. I have Nasaria snails for excess food. Um, I have coral and macro algae for the water. I'm hoping to add a set, some sand sifting stars and also I guess more Nasaria snails for cleaning the sand. And that's mostly all. Gotcha. I love snails. Many I know. Snails. <laughs> We're the snails girls, right? All my tanks just have snails, guys, um, because I'm one of the, and Dan mentioned this, the risk tolerance level. I'm one of those super careful people. Like when I get my seahorses, I name them. <laughs> They're my children and I love them. And I would never even chance for a second anything that, you know, could possibly cause problems. So I do my tanks. I think I, okay, out of my six seahorse tanks, only one has sand. The rest are all bare bottom. None of them have uh, rock that wasn't either bleached and recycled or dry and cycled. And we have another video about that if you need a link. But all of it, you know, I don't, I don't do live rock. I for any reefers that join us, because you guys are, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, live rock is really good in many situations. The natural bacteria that comes in. But unfortunately, you end up with these hitchhikers that we just don't want in a seahorse tank. So anyways, all my tanks are super safe. I always have sumps with a lot of equipment, especially a huge double rated skimmer, uh, lots of flow. And then, you know, I, I do the maintenance also. Obviously, we've got Ray, who's more, I'm going to do the maintenance. I don't need a cleanup crew. But Marina's snail um, description kind of brought up another topic, and that is, you know, certain snails you shouldn't, or it's not that you can't, but they just shouldn't be in a tank without sand, like Nasarius, right? And the sand shifting, I can't talk tonight, you guys, sand sifting stars. So it, what, what kind of cleanup crew should you absolutely not have if you're going bare bottom, or is everything fair play? Any thoughts? Marina? <laughs> it's gone from you. Um, I sort of try for the fish and inverts as well, including cleanup crew. Um, I try to see sort of what's their behavior in the wild? How do they eat in the wild? Mm -hmm. I like um, that. How do they, what, sort of, what is, what's their behaviors like in the wild? And, um, try and replicate that at least to some extent so if it's something that spends all day living in the sand and I, I kind of feel like it should have sand so um I probably wouldn't keep sand sifting stars without sand right but I have seen a lot of people keep Nasaria snails without sand really okay gotcha I have but they didn't last very long right yeah don't they need sand I mean they, they bury in it right well, they were good for, you know, a couple, two, three months, but then they slowly started dropping off. Gotcha. So I guess, I guess the main point, uh, if nobody has a, another, anything else to say about that is just research, you know, guys, make sure that what you're getting is a cleanup crew. You're providing for them what they need too. You know, um, I think, I don't know if it was Marina or someone who messaged me. Actually, I think it was Misty uh, messaged me a, I'm probably saying the wrong name, guys, sorry. But somebody messaged me about having a sand sifting starfish and the fact that because she did so much maintenance on her tank, she ended up having to feed the starfish because there just wasn't enough food. 
So there's there's all these things you have to consider. And I do see all the questions come in, guys. I promise we're going to get there. Hey, Battle OCR. Um, hey, Dylans. Glad to see you again and everyone else who's joined. Um, but I'll grab the questions in just a second. What other thoughts do you have? Do we want to go through what cleanup crew should be, shouldn't be? What you need to make sure you have if you're not going to do the maintenance? Or maybe what a schedule, maintenance schedule looks like? For instance, well, go ahead, Dan. First of all, what is the purpose of the cleanup crew? Oh, you want me to answer it? <laughs> sure. I mean, I mean, let's define what we want the cleanup crew to do, and then you can look at what you want to add to achieve that goal. Yes. Perfect point. Why don't you go ahead? <laughs> no, I, I guess my answer would be. That's why I don't have any. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I don't have anything that I want them to do. Right. And for me, a cleanup crew, for instance, if you know, if you're being careful in a seahorse tank and only feeding what the seahorses eat within 10 minutes, we've talked about that before. We can again if you need us to, but it's not as necessary. But for me, when I have a big tank, like not a, a 30 gallon, but like a 90 gallon tank with sump and all this stuff and lots of flow and I'm feeding and I do turn off the flow to feed, but I feed. And if I, you know, I'm not sitting there watching for the full 10 minutes and if any food is left there i don't want the seahorses to go back and eat it later because of the bacteria that'll grow upon it and hurt the seahorses so i think of a cleanup crew as cleaning up any extra food as marina um mess man i cannot speak tonight as marina said earlier um also to eat any algae that grows on the rocks or you know wherever on the glass etc um but then again, of course, if you're if you're doing the maintenance like you should, it's going to go through the algae cycle. But then you shouldn't have that. Still, most people do. And so I'm rambling. Dan, what's your definition? Well, my purpose is to clean up excess organics that are large enough for them to eat. Um, I wish we had a cleanup crew for micro uh, organics, but uh, leftover food and to some extent, even the waste from a seahorse, there's a lot of organic matter in it. Um, Roughly 24% of, of a seahorse's uh, poop, basically, is uh, organic matter that has not been digested. So a lot of the things like snails and stuff will go after that. We talk about poop here, guys. And Ray, um, what's your answer to that that you've said numerous times? Well, uh, my main thing is uh, don't feed any more than uh, they're going to eat. And... Uh, That'll lessen uh, the amount that uh, you're going to need in the way of a cleanup crew. And one good way to find out if you're feeding too much, let them feed for 10 minutes and uh, leave it another 10 minutes and take a little mini power head and go around the tank blasting at all your decor and around the rocks and that. And if you see stuff, uh, if you see uh, food coming out, then you know you've uh, fed the tank too much. Either that or you don't have sufficient circulation uh, to keep it in uh, suspension. Well, the other thing that can happen there, Ray, is that if somebody has a really dense tank with a lot of rock and a lot of macros, it's pretty easy for food to get trapped where you can't see it and not easily blown out. Um, you know, my systems having some artificial hitches and a bare bottom, real simple. You can see very clearly, very easily. But, you know, I had a customer that had a hundred. 20 gallon uh, sump uh, that was a macro tank that he put seahorses in and that tank was just so packed with stuff that there was just no way that you could blow all the stuff out it was just I mean it was literally packed to the top with macros sure and that's that's one of the big problems with trying to give it you know advice on a grand scale like this is it really does depend so much on the setup on what you got in the tank, what you got in the sump, if there's even a sump. I mean, that changes like everything. Sure, Ray does, uh, you know, tanks without a cleanup crew because he's willing to wipe down the sides, wipe down the bottom, blow it with a blow it with a blow torch. No, I'm kidding. Powerhead. You know, he, he does that maintenance. But Ray, the, the thing I was hoping you'd say, because you've said it so many other times, is that even if the snails or cleanup crew are eating the seahorse, the well, excess food or the poop. Waste. Go ahead. They produce their waste too. Right. And then uh, more microlife uh, eat that waste and uh, they produce waste. 
then it has to go on to another smaller stage. And uh, so you can never really get uh, rid of it all until you're going to use your protein skimmer or water changes to get rid of it. Absolutely. That's that's the point I was hoping you make because the cleanup crew, while we're going to discuss it in detail today, guys, it doesn't replace your filtration is the bottom line that Ray tries to make all the time. And it's a good point because they might eat the food, but they're still pooping too. We're talking poop again. Uh, and so you got to make sure that you have good biological and mechanical filtration, which we talked about in cycling. But um, any other points, guys, I do want everybody to, you know, I do want to go through what's what we what we think is good or bad. Um, but, go ahead. Thing for me, Kelly, I can bring up is my seahorses don't all want to eat in the same 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, really? Huh. So one, one or two will come to the dish and want to eat and then somebody else wants to wait and come, you know, when they're done or one wants to eat what's spilled out of the dish and not even eat in the dish. So they're kind of random. So it's kind of hard for me to have one set 10 minutes where everybody's fed. You know, that they kind of they kind of have me trained too. You know? <laughs> you know what's funny is that absolutely fascinates me because the only tank that I ever had that kind of issue with was was my Barbori tank because they mm -hmm. were really picky. They wanted to look at the food and make sure that the food had eyeballs and all well, these. I look at it too for a while. Yeah, and I have one that likes to crash into the dish and. <laughs> scatter it and then another one that doesn't want to eat until that seahorse scatters it she'd rather eat what he scatters than eat out of the dish. so they kind of have their own personalities and they don't just all chow down in a 10 minute time period you know, have you, it, dan have what, you ever experienced that well it's interesting because what i experience first of all what we try to do is train the seahorses to be aggressive in feeding but mm -hmm. what I normally find is out of a batch of a large batch of seahorses, when I put food in the tank, you got the aggressive feeders that immediately attack it when it hits the water. Yep. You have others that wait for it to come down past them. And you mm -hmm. have others yet wait until the fracas is all done and then they will start eating. Um, mm -hmm. And they'll be slower and more methodical in how they eat. So yeah. there are differences within the seahorses of how they respond to feeding mm -hmm. and you know, I almost think 10 minutes is too short of a time to say that they've, you know, I usually go back 30 minutes later. Yeah, but Dan, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Holly. And I think if they've all eaten within 15 minutes, if everybody's come to the dish and they had their share, then I'll suck it up. But sometimes one will take longer to come, you know, they're just doing their thing. <laughs> if, if I feed the seahorses, they've eaten it all in 10 minutes, I'm feeding them again. Mm -hmm. Wow. Really? I, I feed four yeah, times I feed a day. Twice sometimes. I feed four times a day because I believe the multiple feeding is better for them and that uh, you're not just pushing it through the digestive tract. Uh, mm -hmm. It's having some time to stay in the tract uh, to remove as much nutrient as possible. And uh, even if you... Uh, uh, have a couple feedings that are half an hour or an hour apart, that's enough to slow it up somewhat. So if, <clears throat> if you feed in the morning, uh, two feedings an hour apart before you go to work and then uh, two feedings at night uh, when you come back an hour apart, then uh, I think that's better for them than uh, doing fewer, heavier uh, feedings through the day. Well, I agree with that. Um, I'm curious, and I want to hear what Marina was going to say, but Dan, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Obviously, it's, it is better for the seahorses to feed more times what they'll well, eat, but go ahead. Yeah, as a breeder, we were feeding an average of seven to eight times a day. Um, we'd go around it roughly every two hours, and we would feed, and then by the time we got feeding, it'd be 10 or 15 minutes, and we would come back and see who had cleaned up and who hadn't. And those who had really cleaned up, we had dumped a little bit more food in before we put the food away. Um, now that I'm not doing it breeding commercially at the moment, um, I have two tanks left with seahorses and I feed those guys on average twice a day. I try to feed them, you know, similar to what Ray's talking about. And it's more because I'm working all day and I'm not there to feed them. But when I'm home, I try to feed them at, 
at least three times a day, if not more. Right. And, and there are people that do, you know, have a very busy schedule. And so I just want to, I just wanted to make the point that while it is best for a seahorse, because in the wild they eat continuously, it's better for them to have more feedings that are smaller. Um, you know, if you're working and you can only feed them two to three times a day, you know, don't, don't like kill yourself about it. You know, just do the best you can and live treats help, treats help. And we've talked about that. Marina, I want to give you a chance. I know you were trying to say something and you got caught up. I was just going to ask a question, actually, with the feeding dish. Um, like I know the reason that we don't want food sitting in the tank for too long because it gets covered in bacteria and stuff. But if it's sitting in a feeding dish that um, is cleaned every time it's used in bleach or whatever, um, something that kills the germs, is it actually okay for the food to sit in the dish longer or is the problem the water or just the fact that it's defrosted? So you're asking about the food sitting in the dish for a long period of time, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, or just for longer than the um, that... 10, 15 situation? Well, long term, I wouldn't want the food to sit there because as it's laying there, it's going to slowly become colonized with bacteria. So, you know, eventually it's going to start getting to the point where you want it removed anyway. I don't think you have to remove it in 10 minutes. You know, the nice thing about the feeding dish is that you've kept all the food in one place in theory. And, you know, I would probably not want it to sit there more than 30 minutes to an hour and I would remove it. The other thing I'd like to say about feeding dishes is a lot of people have the tube um, that where they put the food in the tube and it drops into the feeding dish. And if that's not a removable tube, the feeding dish itself needs to be removed after feeding because the water gets stagnant in that tube and put your nose over it and it'll stink to high heavens. Um, so I, if you're going to use a tube to put the food in the feeding dish, it should be a removable tube. Yeah. And guys, if you don't know what he's talking about, if you look up a seahorse feeder, there are some that they've got a tube and then a dish. And, and I know Holly makes her own. Um, but yeah, just and Marina, to, to get really specific to your specific question, it's the water. Um, and there's no definite like in 30 or in 22.2 minutes bacteria grows on it it's just kind of like happening as it sits you know so you don't want to see horse to go back and eat food that was tucked behind a rock three hours later because that would be really bad um but holly on your dish i'm really curious um it, can you tell me about your dish because i've used everything from little omega one those um things yeah, you yeah. slap on the side at the clip things like for nori yeah, i've used yeah. one of those to use a to put a plastic container in there i've done all sorts of dishes and i never did had luck with dishes well i've used different things originally i started with an actual officially made for seahorses feeding dish that had the tube you're talking about and I did not like the tube. I ended up removing it because as the seahorses grew, they had a hard time getting their snouts inside the tube because it, it wouldn't come out of the tube into the dish. It gets stuck in there. Mm -hmm. So I removed that. And then after a while, I figured out, especially as the seahorses were growing, that an actual soap dish with suction cups like you get just from the Ben Bath store or places like that works great. Um, I've also used um, clam shells that you use for like grilling clams. You know, like stuffed clams on the grill, clean those yeah. out with peroxide. And I set those like at first when I'm training the fry to eat from a dish, I'll put a little clam shell on the floor and put their food in there when they're learning. And then as they grow, I move it up, put it inside of a soap dish. Huh. My adults now are eating just from a suction cup soap dish and they love it. And the one thing I love about it is it's a lot deeper than the um, tray style official seahorse feeding dish that I used to use was only like probably less than a half an inch thick. And they used to get in it and scatter the food everywhere. Right. And in this soap dish, it's probably eh, maybe an inch, inch and a half deep. 
So the food stays in it a lot better. It makes it a lot easier to clean. Yep. And the seahorse is actually, they've been treating it like a jacuzzi. They like to lay it. <laughs> I know I've, I've posted some of your pictures. I, I, I know we've gotten way off topic, guys. I promise you I'm jumping to the questions in just a second. But final thing for you, Holly, because when I did try a feeding dish, and I literally have systems that I can, you know, I usually use a pump and power heads that I have controllers. So yeah. um, I can turn off the flow. Usually the controller has a button that you can press and turn off the flow for like 10 minutes or what, as long as you want. Um, you you uh, control it and so I would turn everything off which kind of you know I don't I don't really know if that messes up filtration but it, it would work somewhat but in some seahorse tanks where I had seahorses that were rowdy like yours they'd still just make a mess of it it wasn't worth it so how do you just the deep dish you I don't, don't? no I don't I actually, I'm usually able to find a spot in the tank. I don't have high flow all over the whole tank. Right. So I'll have a section that's calm, and that's where I'll put the food dish so the food doesn't blow away. I mean, a little bit does, especially if they get in it and scatter it. Then it'll go flying everywhere. But another thing is the deeper the dish, the less a problem you have with the flow blowing it away. True. I've got one last story before we move on, though. <laughs> when I had adolescents that were like, yay big, I mean, like maybe uh, two, two and a half inches, mm -hmm. I tried to do a feeding dish. I chose a, you know, a Tupperware container that was way too deep, and they uh -huh. got in to eat as I trained them, and they couldn't get out. They couldn't figure out to swim up. <laughs> They would sit in there going, ah, what do I do? Okay, so. I think that was just a female, wasn't it? Mine sometimes. Ray, I'm coming to Canada and beating your butt. <laughs> what, Holly? I was saying my, there is a learning curve because, like, I'm using clear soap dishes, right? It takes them a little while to learn. They can't go through the clear plastic. Yeah, they were clear what I was using. They have to come up and go down in it. So, right. yeah, it takes them a little while, but they figure it out. Yep. Okay. I, uh, I go ahead, Marina. I was just going to say, I had one of those tube sort of where it's the tube and goes into the dish um, feeding stations, and it was clear. And I took it out after one use because... I drop in the mice and the, the, they were really attacking it. Um, they were pretty good eaters. And so they were actually whacking their heads on the tube as the mice fell down. And it was like the length of a ruler. So it was like 12 inches of them just bashing their heads, trying to catch the mice in this tube. And I'm like, okay, they're going to get a concussion. And I pulled it straight out and have never used it again. Right. I don't mean to laugh. It's not funny, but <laughs> it sounds out The turkey baster. I have a female that when she was new, yeah, when I first got her, I mean, she knew what the turkey baster was. I don't know if Alyssa uses them also. That's where I got her. But she knew the food was in the turkey baster and she kept pecking at the turkey baster when I went to feed them. It took her a while to learn. But she eventually got it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, real quick before I jump in. Oh, I'm sorry. Dan, what were you showing us? What are you showing us? Sorry. Well, I was just showing you the way that I was feeding seahorses. And, of course, I had a whole lot more of them. But you can see they're very aggressive when they're feeding. And that's doing it multiple times a day. Um, but I put food in there. And instead of putting enough food for them to feed at one time because I have so many, I have to keep adding it because I don't want it to all just go down to the bottom and then feed off the bottom. Um, but they can be quite aggressive when you've got a bunch of them trained properly. And the, as you can see by the number of them, a feeding dish doesn't work. Um, that's the reason that we have to broadcast feed. And a turkey baster doesn't work if you have a lot of seahorses as well. Absolutely. I, I, I can say for myself, all of my tanks are species only, but my erectus tanks obviously have more seahorses because I bred them for a bit. And so my, sorry guys, I'll get this back uh, big screen. Um, had him spotlighted. Oh geez, how do I turn that off? All right. There we go. Gallery view. That's it. All right. Anyhow, um, so in my barbori tank, I only had two barbori and I had to use a turkey baster because they were so darn picky. 
and I had to make sure the food was right in front of them, that they could see it, that they actually ate it, because if it hit the floor, they weren't eating it. And not all Barbori are like that. I just had some uh, princess uh, special type uh, I actually prefer to watch the fish chase down their food rather than uh, just eat it out of a dish. Right. And I, you know what, Ray, I agree with that too. And I was going to say in my rectus tanks, I, I, tar I uh, broadcast feed every single one of them. Um, and they're, and then it, in my opinion, I know Ray, you're really good at maintenance and, and keeping track, but in my opinion, because I have so much rock and so many places, as Dan pointed out for food to get stuck or whatever, that's why I need to make sure that I have a cleanup crew in any tank that I broadcast feed. So um, just kind of throwing out the point that maybe if you have a, a targeted feeding system, you can monitor it better, but mainly the whole point is make sure you don't have leftover foods. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Dan brought up a good point that, because I've noticed this, he's like, when you have a lot, you know, they kind of go into a feeding frenzy. They're more excited about yeah. eating. And I noticed that like before, cause I sold, you know, all of my batch except for the two that I kept. Yay. And now that there's only two left, they're not as excited about eating really? as when I had a bunch of them. That's so interesting because I know Dan, it's Dan's phrase, I'm stealing it, but I always tell people, erectus, healthy erectus that you get from a captive breeding facility breeder, they, they go if you walk by with a peanut butter sandwich they're rushing the glass and saying gimme i mean i've never experienced that with erectus it's just does it depend on the personality dan or no it happens there's there's a greater uh need to get the food when you got more of them in there than when there's just oh, a couple competition um, That's how it is. Yeah. see i only have a few so the when i have a few yeah they're not as excited about everybody coming to eat as when i had several they're also copycats. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you got one guy that goes streaking across the tank to get the food. The others are like, oh, what am I missing? And they're, yep. you know, it, it's. It might be just, a girl. <laughs> Sorry. Well, true. Sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we, we do. I do want to uh, make sure that before we stop this, this stream, guys, we're going to go through and kind of um, take any questions about what is acceptable as cleanup crew, what we should avoid. But I do want to get to the questions. First off, D from Brooklyn, you just finished shoveling. I'm guessing it's snowing where you're at because it's snowing here too, and I'm not happy about it. Boo, boo, boo. That was a thumbs down. I did it wrong. Anyways, um, and let's see. We talked about dwarf seahorses. Did we ever get the off-topic question? Okay, a Facebook eaters are asked, when doing a water change, is there a need to heat up the water? If the water's it cold, yes. Cold, the water is to start with. So everybody kind of at the same time said it depends on how the temperature of the water. So I guess the main answer would be you want the temperature to be extremely close to the temperature of the tank, which needs to be under 74 degrees. But if you have like freezing water, then yeah, heat it up to 74 or whatever you're keeping your tank at. Anybody got anything to add to that? Yeah, I match mine as close as I can to the water in the tank within a degree or so, three or two. Maybe I'm just really lazy, but I usually don't unless it's a big water change. If I'm doing just like a little 10% water change, even if it's like five degrees cooler or whatever, um, at 10 percent it's not gonna it doesn't do too much good point but, um, yeah if i'm doing sort of anything more than 15 i i worry about it unless of course it's boiling like we've had a few hot days here and the water's been 40 degrees celsius Ooh. i don't know that's very that's very hot <laughs> um so i make sure i cool it down first Sure, because I mean, that's why we keep our tank, a seahorse tanks under 74 degrees. We don't want that hot water because bacteria grows. Cause so I'm just sitting here thinking about it. If you're mixing salt water and whatnot in a bucket and it's that hot, ooh, you need to cool it down. How do you cool it down, Marina? So I am, um, my mom hates it. I've got <laughs> to bring tub and I bring it inside. And if I start mixing it like the day before, and I'll just leave it until it's cooled down enough. Or I'll freeze um, RO water 
and chuck in our ice cubes. Gotcha. We used to keep uh, bottles in the freezer that were uh, filled with water for that very purpose. Absolutely. Just like a, a milk bottle or whatever frozen with water, just drop it in to cool it down. So it out yeah. The yeah. yeah, the milk bottle works, but uh, we would, the small, I always tried to get uh, flat or uh, smaller bottles because they would cool faster. I just put more of them in there. So I had more surface area. Absolutely. Great point. Okay. And then, and that's, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Maria. I just said that makes sense. Yep. And I wanted to mention, guys, uh, the reason I, I call you Facebook user instead of using your name if you're on Facebook, I really apologize. It's because I instead of jumping to each place that this is streaming, uh, I have one place where it streams, but unfortunately, Facebook usernames don't show up. I got to fix that soon. I apologize. Um, so I'm not trying to disrespect. I just don't see the name. But another Facebook user asked, what would be the best tank mates for a dwarf seahorse tank? I'm going to say nothing, but go ahead. Dan, anybody else? Live mice will work. Live mice, it's a good one. Is there anything else that you can keep with dwarf, dwarf seahorses? Anybody? I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I'm very hesitant. I, you know, I've heard people say you can do this, you can do that, and I've experimented. And, you know, even the Saria snails can grab a uh, baby dwarf. Hey, don't let me stop this stream without covering that because we need to talk about the fact that we, well, uh, we can just talk about it now. But bottom line is, when we're talking about, when we talk about what we use as cleanup crew in our seahorse tanks, that is not talking about a dwarf seahorse tank. He just made the great point. Even a snail could harm a dwarf or a fry. So the only, basically the only tank mate or cleanup crew you can have in a dwarf tank is live mice, right? I mean... It's the only thing I've come up with. And if, if you in the comment section have come up with something else, let us know. But we want to know how long you've done it. Because <laughs> people say they've done stuff and it's for a month. And I'm like, nah, I need to see it for a year before I even try it. Think about it. Okay, so good question, though. And we already covered sea urchins. I already said hey to battle. And you, and D, you have short sea uh Spine urchins, gotcha. And just just to like go back to that for one second, guys. Um, we talked about risk tolerance and etc. But what's the fear there? Because like we've covered in the past, you got a, I don't know how to pronounce it right. Asterina, Asterina, however you say it. Um, those little white stars that you see one, and all of a sudden there's five thousand. And we always tell people hitchhikers or something you want to avoid in a seahorse tank. That's why you don't want to use uh, live rock if you can help it because like those particular stars will crawl up on a seahorse while they're sleeping because seahorses grow algae on themselves. They'll just think they're eating. They're not trying to hurt the seahorse. They're just trying to eat the algae and they'll end up damaging the seahorse's skin and causing you a big problem. So, you know, there's all these hitchhikers that we want to avoid, but with urchins, the, I think I'm thinking the only danger is like if a seahorse was stupid enough to like go up and, stab itself right Dan well I wouldn't put urchins in with dwarfs um, not dwarfs right um, but the bigger seahorses some of the urchins can actually work you know I would stay away from ones with sharp um, pencil type things and if you look on seahorse.org the only urchin that they list is the long spine urchin which they give a threat level of four right. um, but, you know, the ones that I pulled out of the lagoon, we pulled two. They, they were both a little bit different. Both of them were relatively short-spined, and all they did was go after the algae. And I never had a problem with them. Very cool. And, um, the again... The that go after algae are okay, but the ones that are detrivore eaters, uh, uh, they're too susceptible to uh, get latching on to a sleeping seahorse uh, at nighttime. Just like the stars, right? Yep. Yeah. Gotcha. So there's a good differentiation. And um, again, sorry, I don't know the names, but another Facebook user said he tried a pencil urchin, uh, but heard a horror story about them, so he went in the other tank. I, I hear you. You know, it's I'm like better safe than sorry kind of person. So <laughs> again, I told Marina, I hate this topic because I'm a snail girl, but it's an important to topic to cover. Um, and Battle OCR, you said your cleanup crew, other than fish, on your 650 gallon is just two urchins. 
very cool but i'm curious is that i'm guessing that's reef tank which we love would love to hear how having only that cleanup crew worked out and what other equipment you're using to make that happen um but yeah in it you know in a seahorse tank it's a little different um but i do want to hear more about it for sure and thanks steve for asking everybody to everybody like this video darn it like it subscribe okay and then what about limpet snail like okay they are snail like creatures but seem not to be a pest actually i think limpet d you know what that is the snail i called it a snail that i was talking about last week aren't limpets the little things that you find in your um like in your plumbing or whatever and all of a sudden they show up out of nowhere and then they're everywhere but they're just little teeny tiny things that you see on the glass and they look like kind of like a helmet like not not exactly like a snail. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Shape. That's a they have like a cone shaped shell, don't they? Like a they're oval shaped. Round, yeah. And yeah. they have a hole in the center. And when they're spawning, they're um, pumping up through that spawn comes up through the center hole. Uh, the ones I had in my reef tanks, uh, uh, they would get, uh, I guess the biggest would be maybe inch, inch and a quarter. Sure. But the ones that I have uh, in this Barbary tank here, they actually, I, I just suspect they came from the rock, but I haven't figured out why. Uh, that rock was in one of my reef tanks that had limpets, but they were a lot larger. And that rock was sitting dry out of the tank for quite a few years before I set up this barb tank. Yep. And then they never showed up for the first, say, three and a half, four years uh, that I had the barbs in here. And then all of a sudden they started showing up and uh, now I got scads of them. But oh. at this point anyway, I don't have any large ones. The biggest one's probably a little over a quarter of an inch on the long direction. Gotcha. Well, before anybody says anything else, to my reef friends that are watching, this is driving me crazy. We talked about it last week. I couldn't think of the name. I still haven't thought of the dang name. And I looked it up and I couldn't find the dang name. And it's not limpets because I just Googled it. And anybody know the little roundish, tiny, I call them snails, but maybe they're not classified as a snail, but they use, they come out of nowhere. You don't know where they came from. You didn't buy them. You didn't add them. The rock was dry and cycled. There's no way like Ray was just talking about but they don't have that cone shape. They're like little round things and they just appear and they're everywhere and they're tiny, but they're awesome. <laughs> if, you, if anybody thinks of the name, please share it because it's killing me. I'm gonna like take a picture of one and share it because I gotta know the name, I can't remember it. And I love them and I've actually taken them from like a reef tank or wherever and uh, don't tell anybody because shame on me, there was no quarantine there, tisk tisk. Um, but I've added them to seahorse tanks uh, to try to get them to multiply in seahorse tanks and for some reason they won't i just don't get it like they appear out of nowhere and they won't they won't multiply where they don't want to multiply so let me know but did anybody else have anything to say about limpets other than no, yay i don't have any of those but i net those little tiny snails you're talking about i have those and i always they're just baby snails is that not true uh, you kind of broke up. You said you thought you were they were just baby snails? Uh-oh, what just happened? They were just baby snails. The really tiny ones? Are they not? Uh, no. The ones that I'm talking about have a specific name. I'm not trying to drive everybody crazy, but it's driving me crazy. <laughs> so yeah, when are I'm you talking about these ones, snails. Kelly? Weird. Okay. Hang on. Is Marina the one sharing right now? Yeah. Okay, let me look. Yeah, I'm coming. No, the stomatellas or however you say it. No, that's not them. Mine are really round. I like those guys too with the little helmet hats. Those are awesome too. But no, that's I not. I like them as well. It's it's driving me crazy. I'm gonna figure it out and I'm gonna share it as soon as I do in a post, guys. I but I I I'm don't remember the name. Them out of my filter sock and they're really tiny. I always just thought they were babies of my bigger snails. No, yeah, and, I added them. and if anybody's trying to help me with this, uh, trying to figure out what the name is, I'll tell you, you can't buy them because I tried. I begged people, you know, when I found out how beneficial they were to a tank, I was like, please, they eat like something special or something, but they're very small. 
I'm going to quit rambling. When I find it, I'll share it, I promise, because they're awesome. And if you get them, definitely don't remove that. That's cleanup crew you want. All right. Um, so going on here. Uh, off topic, because I did initially, but it took a while for your question to load. Okay, if I've missed uh, questions as I go through, please feel free to ask it again. I'm so sorry um, if I missed a question. Okay, uh, Dee said, if you're not using live rock or sand, what's your biological media? Rock in the sump? Uh, where'd everybody I go? I use bio balls. Hang on, you guys. Everybody disappeared on me. There you are. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, go ahead, uh, Holly. I was saying I used bio balls in my stuff, the plastic balls that grow bacteria. And I think K1 media, like Dan uses, mm -hmm. is another thing you can do. The first thing I would say to answer that question is when you've got a little free time, go watch the Wine Wednesday Cycling um, live chat because Dan covered not only what you have to worry about for biological and mechanical filtration, but he like went into detail about, you know, what can be used and stuff. But Dan, how would you answer that briefly? Well, in my case, I use a bioreactor, but um, there's multiple things you can do. There's, I mean, putting rock in a sump is one, one possible method, but um, I, I strictly use a bioreactor with K1 media. Anybody else? And, and guys, uh, anybody watching, is there static? I keep hearing static, but I don't know if it's just on my end. So if there's static, let me know. But uh, Marina, what are your thoughts? Um, I love ceramic media, artificial ceramic media. Um, there's quite a few brands. I'm not sure if you guys get them, but there's quite a few brands that we get here um, that are really tough. They're really strong, so they don't just like crumble over time yep. and they're super porous and yeah i just love those so i use a lot of that do you know do you remember which wine wednesday you shared pictures of that in i can't remember i have no idea <laughs> i remember i remember sharing them before i can share them again now sure while you pull it up though uh ray what kind of um kind of things do you use uh, you caught me again. I'm looking up stuff on limpets. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's all good. We, for what? Uh, filtration. Like if you don't use live rock, his point was if you don't use live rock, what I do, do you use? use? Rock. You do use live rock. Yeah, but it's in the sump. That's so, what I was just talking about. The limpets came from the live rock that used to be in uh, one of my reef tanks. And uh, that uh, without being used for years, just dry. And then when I set up this uh, Barbary tank, um, then I uh, put that in the sump and uh, I put in uh, ammonium chloride and uh, made it live. And uh, that's been there ever since. Gotcha. I think the key that we were trying to hit on uh, when we talk about live rock um, is basically that if you add live rock from a store or whatever, you're going to get the hitchhikers. Um, so most of us doing seahorse tanks will actually let the rock dry out or bleach the rock or whatever and then recycling it. Again, go watch that Cycling Wine Wednesday because we cover it in detail. Um, but I'm curious, do you guys think that if you use live rock in a sump, does that make a difference? Like I know with, with spores of algae, you're worried about anything in the sump traveling up to the display tank. But uh, for instance, Dan... Uh, if you have, if you put live rock in the sun, would you still be fearful? Like live rock from a, a pet store. I would treat it just like I would be putting it in the tank. And that's because. Well, ultimately what's ever there can get into the tank. Yeah. Well, and I was just thinking like, obviously there are more reasons than just hitchhikers that we choose to use dry rock and, and cycle it ourselves. Um, and we cover that in cycling video, but, uh, basically I was just thinking if it, if your only fear was hitchhikers, like if, if it was your own tank and you knew that it was good and you knew that there was no disease, obviously you can't see bacteria and such, but if you were say pulling rock from your reef sump and using it, somebody's sharing it and using it, um, 
in your new seahorse tank, you would still say dry and cycle it, Dan? No. You know, there's some people that use live rock without doing anything to it. Right. Um, if I had rock in my own tank that I wanted to transfer, I would probably have the second thoughts about sterilizing it and, and restarting the whole process. Um, you know, I, I, I see a lot of people that do that where they'll take rock from one tank and move it to another. Gotcha. Just wanted to make sure that was clear. Okay, go ahead, Marina. It's just these um, fireballs and it also comes in these blocks. Yep. And they're really great. And I think we talked in that previous one Wednesday because we do, we have like uh, two, maybe more companies that actually make something very similar. Brightwell Bricks, Marine Pure, um, there's a couple others, uh, I think. But in your case, the big difference for you was the fact that they don't crumble, they don't leach anything, they're like superior, right? Do you think? Okay, I'm Yeah, walk. so these ones don't. Sorry, I think my internet's being a bit laggy. It's okay. These ones don't crumble at all. Um, I had a lot of marine pure to start with, but I'm now sort of slowly um, replacing it all with these. Um, you can drop them off the roof and they won't crack. Um, well, when we're done, pure... I, know, I know that you're in Australia, um, but it, when we're done, if you could post a link in the comment section, um, it would be great because just in case somebody finds a product very similar or if they're in Australia, then they could get it. Would you do that when we're done? Yeah, okay. there's um, quite a few brands that make the exact same product. I think it's GAE uh, um, AMS Maxpect. Do you guys get Maxpect stuff? Yes, we do. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they make it and Mantis makes some. And I'm pretty sure they're all the exact same product made in the same place, just branded differently. Um, but, um, yeah, they're just really good. All my marine pure has sort of started crumbling. Sure. And makes sort of turns to sand. And we got, we got to get somebody from marine pure in here to talk about that. But I do know that uh, at least Brightwell redid their formula or something, you know. Uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen anymore because they were leach leaching something. Alum I can't Aluminium? Remember. Yeah. I think it was. Yeah. And so I know they fixed that problem and it's no longer a problem. And I love those products too, for sure. I'm with you. Um, but definitely something in the sump that's, that's used for filtration big time because most seahorse tanks are not as crowded with rock because that's if you think about it that's not where seahorses come from they come from a totally different area and even if they're captive bred you know and will go in whatever tank you put them in you still want to make it natural to them um, even people who use fake plants and then have the uh, filtration media in the sump you know try to make it spacious but holly also mentioned earlier it's really important to have spaces of high flow and spaces of lower flow and be please believe flow will be a topic possibly even this coming week um okay back to the questions unless anybody had anything else uh d said sailfin mollies are good cleanup crew i'm curious you guys because i actually do have a seahorse tank where i um took freshwater mollies got them into, you know, got them, I can't, acclimated to salt water and had them in a seahorse tank. Has anybody used molly? Else? I got some mollies and I bought them to sort of eat. Um, they were, again, freshwater ones um, that I acclimated to salt water. And I got them because they're meant to be good algae eaters and I thought they'd also help eat leftover food. But I found that they just eat so much and um, eat so quickly that I just ended up having to feed so much more to feed them and to make sure the others still got some. And then they were so full from all the food being fed three to five times a day from the seahorses that they didn't touch the algae. Oh, yeah. Actually, that's funny okay. you mentioned that because that's what happened to me with peppermint shrimp. 
Um, and, and I know I'm jumping around guys, but hear me out just for a second. I had a cleanup crew of complete snails. That's it, snails, right? And then I found out my tank had Aptasia. And I was like, oh God, because you don't want Aptasia in a seahorse tank. Let me make that clear because somebody asked me that the other day. You do not want Aptasia or any kind of anemone in a seahorse tank. Bad, bad, don't do it, get it out, right? Okay, and so I was trying all the methods online. I tried to kill it uh, by injecting something or Joe's juice or one of those things. Aptasia X. I tried one of those and I missed apparently because ne the next day I had five new anemones <laughs> or, or Aptasia um, in different places because when you miss they spurt out their little spores and then you get more of them. Anyhow, long story short, I thought well peppermint shrimp that's the answer. If I get the right species of peppermint shrimp and I add them to the tank they'll take care of the Aptasia. Unfortunately, I didn't know at the time, if they're not hungry, they're not going to hunt, which was what Marina just was talking about. So I added these peppermint shrimp. They ate the seahorse leftovers or some of the seahorse food, and then I still had Aptasia. And what I ended up learning is if you, it sounds cruel, but come on, man, we got, we got a job to do here. If you let the, make sure that the peppermint shrimp are hungry before you add them, maybe keep them in a separate tank for a day without feeding or, you know, get them after, you know, you know, they haven't been fed all day or whatever. And then you add them to your tank and don't feed for a while. Then they'll go after the Aptasia and get used to eating them. There's other tricks too. That might be another topic coming up for sure. But, um, Marina's point is good. Any fish that's going to out eat the seahorses or even move around fast can be a danger. Dan, have you, what's your thoughts on mollies? Are they too fast to, and do they stress seahorses out? Well, there's different reasons people add mollies. Some people add them as a food source because they will often breed. I don't like feeding freshwater organisms to seahorses with any uh, significant amount. Um, I do think they're a bit fast moving. Um, and I do see the point of where there's somewhat of a glutton when it comes to feeding. Gotcha. I'm not particularly fond of the idea. Okay. Well, there you have it. You can do it, but at your own risk, bottom line, you know, um, if you put too many in and they eat all the food, this, they'll get really fat, poop a lot, add to the organics, and your seahorses will be hungry. <laughs> but but we can I talk on the side. Maria? I actually moved those mollies to the reef tank um because i didn't want them in with the seahorses anymore so i moved them in there while i'm sort of waiting to get was waiting to get other fish and stuff and um at the moment there's one still in there and i'm trying to catch a blenny and i've got a fish trap in there to catch the blenny and i constantly i've only been feeding in the fish trap so i'm not feeding anywhere else but the fish trap so that they can get in there and i kid you not the molly has been eating for about three days now, has not left the fish trap and has not stopped eating. Oh, I came down at three o'clock in the morning and it was still in there eating. I haven't seen it not eating. Oh, God. Like I'm worried it's just going to pop. <laughs> Thank right. you so much. So, so maybe not the best plan unless you've got mollies that you already are, you know, used to and they're not piggies, but right. Gotcha. Um, they are pigs and um, not only that I think with anything I think like mysis is like lobster and aptasia and algae is like broccoli most most fish and inverts when you start feeding them mysis they're going to prefer that over yep. what you got them to eat great point and and that's you know the overall point is with cleanup crew you really, you, it's a balance. It's every, everything's a balance, you guys. But with a cleanup crew, it's a balance. Like some, some cleanup crew members, you don't want to add until there's algae, if that's all they eat. Because if you add them and you don't have algae, they're going to die. Sand sifting stars. If you add them and then your tank's too clean, they're going to die if you don't feed them. So it's, it's kind of this, this big balance thing. So, um, let me know if you have any other questions. Cause I know we're jumping around guys. <laughs> Okay, um, Facebook user also said, I'm just trying to learn as much as you can about dwarfs. Awesome. Research is the key. A plus for you. Um, you have an established tank with seven adults and about 30 babies ranging from days old to teenagers. 
Still a learning process. I have sand and gorgonians in the tank as well as plastic decor. Well, first off, I'm going to say, if you've already got babies going and it's been going for a while, how long's the tank been going? I'm curious. But you're already doing better than most people that could keep dwarfs. Anybody else argue that? I mean, if, if, if the dwarf is already, if the dwarf seahorses are already having babies and he's being successful and he's only got gorgonians and plants, obviously he's doing a good job, correct? He or she, sorry. Nobody ever answers me when I ask you. <laughs> Dan, any thoughts on that? Sorry, I was busy doing something else. They what all ignore question? me, y'all. They all ignore me. I said, sorry. I said, if someone exactly. is keeping dwarfs. I heard you. I said. I think you're right, because I did keep dwarves years ago for a very brief time, and I had a hard time with them. They didn't last long. Right. I mean, dwarf seahorses are much more difficult than the large species. I'll say that again. And just if you have had dwarfs for some time and they're having babies, you're doing a great job. But I would stick to your original plan, just having the gorgonians and the plastic hitches and etc. Any kind of extra equipment and such, you can put in a sump. If you don't have one, add one if you want. But as, I mean, Ray is proof that you can do this without a clinic crew. You can do the maintenance and, you know, succeed. It's just a lot harder as the tank gets bigger and with bigger species. And the key to keeping seahorses healthy and happy is keeping organics low. So obviously you're doing a good job already so I would just personally say keep doing what you're doing, but I know it's a lot of work, so that's probably why you're asking. <laughs> Let me know if I if I got that right, what you were asking. And let's see. Snails seem to be lazy. I do their job. You know what? I'm curious. Anybody else here keep... Oh, Marina had to go, apparently. Sorry, Marina. Anybody else here keep just snails? I guess not. Right. Okay, I'm the only, only snail person. With only snails, my answer to that comment would be add more <laughs> because I think they're awesome. And if you get a species of snail that, that is directed at your problem, like algae or whatever you're trying to do, like I start with a certain amount of cleanup crew in every tank just to make sure, but then if I have a problem, I'll add more of a certain species. I'll link that article again, but yeah, in my, in my case, I would just add more. And if anybody else has thoughts, feel free. Okay, and Dylan, great point. He's worried about snails eating macros. Ray, uh, oh, you don't keep snails. Never mind. Any, anybody have any comments about snails eating your macro instead of the nuisance algae? I haven't noticed that at all with the two macros that I have. I did have a couple um, of the hermit crabs that sampled the macro algae, but then they ended up not really eating it. So it was all right. Gotcha. Well, I can say to you, I have absolutely experienced that. In my beautiful macro tank that was like my favorite tank ever, I added, I think it was, I think it was turbo snails. And I added the wrong, like it was, there was a choice between Mexican turbo snails and then another species of turbo snails. And I added the wrong one and they went after my macros. I literally had to remove them and put them in the reef tank. Again, I'll mention, I will link this article below. This article was written a long time ago, but he was very specific about if, if you have, if you don't want them to eat macros, don't get this kind of snail. And so I, when I found that article, I followed it all these years and I can keep macro tanks. No problem because I buy the snails that won't eat that but we'll eat the nuisance algae. So promise you'll get that before we're done. All right. What other questions have I missed? Uh, Dylan said, so I just wanted to give good news. I'm so excited. My tank is set up, got rock, got water, cycling a bucket full of filtration using ammonia. Woo! You are so amazing. Great job, Dylan. We like it. Love it. All right. And... D asked, how many, how can a hobbyist feed that many times a day other than morning and after work? I'm at a loss. Uh, we did talk about this earlier, so I'm going back through the questions again, but D, I think we already said too, you know, there are many people that are extremely successful feeding two times a day. And in that case, you would, does anybody want to really quickly cover how to figure out how much to feed seahorses? 
I'm calling on Dan. Oh, Holly, sorry. I only feed my adults two times a day and they're fine with that, really. Um, it's it's kind of like we talked about before. You just have to watch them when you feed them and you figure out after a while how much they will eat and the shortest amount of time. Like 10 minutes is great, but you know, if they're slower like mine and one comes to the dish and leaves and then somebody else comes, I mean, as long as you're cleaning up, like Dan said, within half an hour to an hour or so, you know, that's what I do. I feed them twice a day. And honestly, if sometimes if I'm home, like on a weekend or other times, if I see one come to the dish, they're looking for food, I'll go ahead and feed it. So yeah. then I might feed them three or four times a day if that, if I see them looking for food, but Right. Two times a day, they're not starving. They're doing just fine. I've had them a couple years, and they're doing all right with that. Yeah, if your seahorse's stomach, sorry, if your seahorse's stomach isn't like caved in, you're probably doing a good enough job. And what I did when I was working, now I'm not working, so I can feed more. But I was in a working situation where I could only feed twice a day for sure, and it worked out. And what I would do is, when I was feeding only twice a day once a week, once a month, whenever I had extra money, whenever ever I had extra time, whatever, what I would do is I would buy live Artemia brine shrimp. I would gut load those brine shrimp with probiotics and, you know, any kind of enhancements. And then I would feed that to the seahorses as a treat. Now that was just me giving them a little boost, but I, I feel like it helped, but certainly people have gotten along just fine feeding seahorses twice a day with frozen mice. Dan, your thoughts? Well, the the feed the, the animals will grow based upon the feed. And if you've got young seahorses, if you want them to get bigger, it's probably better to feed more often. You know, I've, I've, people have often wondered how the hell I got, you know, some of my seahorses the size I got them. For example, I've had erectus at 9 and 10 inches. Yep. And that's because we feed them and feed them and feed them. Uh, we feed our broodstock just like we feed their juveniles and they grow faster, they get bigger. Um, they'll survive at one feeding a day. They will survive with two feedings a day. I normally recommend three feedings. And for people who work, the easiest way to do that is to feed them in the morning before going to work. For most people, if you're working a normal eight to five job when you get home from work and then again later in the evening before lights out. Um, that works for most people. People that work from home, you know, they have the leisure of doing it however they want to. Um, and if I go, if somebody's going away, my normal recommendation is while they're gone and they have a sitter or somebody coming in to feed them is to limit it to once a day so the tank doesn't get overfed. Good point. Right. And that, and that's a really good point because the point is, you know, the seahorses can live, do okay with even just one feeding a day for a week or two. Um, but, you know, it's just not the best for them. But yeah, D, don't worry. I, and guys uh, in the in the video chat, um, we have, since D and Ryan came and uh, we're on the channel, we've got a lot of reefers that are extremely interested in keeping seahorses. So, um, we need to make sure that we cover, you know, things that matter to them, if that makes sense. Like, you know, they might be not be able to do things exactly as all of us pure, we, you know, love seahorses, totally about seahorse people do, but they can succeed and do a great job, especially all these really high up guys who are using extensive equipment instead of having to do all that maintenance. So, um, in a specific situation, I would say post and seahorse sources group <laughs> or ask so specifically on this channel and we will for sure make sure you you get set up right all right anything else about that uh, uh d asked if there was any dry foods they'll eat and i've never seen that happen anybody no i will say i do feed my goby um table shrimp occasionally <laughs> And I have seen the seahorses go after it once in a while out of curiosity and take a bite of that. <laughs> they um, won't eat it, eat it. They're just curious. The, the first thing you have to remember with dried food, especially when you're dealing with pellets, 
is that seahorses snick the food, they macerate the food, and if you've got hard food, you could, the seahorse can injure themselves while trying to eat. Um, the freeze-dried food, if it's resaturated, that can work if they'll take it. Some will, some won't. Um, I've done experiments with food manufacturers where we tried to come up with a food that was um, something other than live food and other than you know frozen shrimp. And we even played around with trying to have food that was made to look like shrimp. And they would recognize that there was food in the tank and they would look around for the food, but they wouldn't strike at the, the food that was in the tank. And it was interesting to watch because it was clear they were puzzled because they knew there was food in the tank. You know, it's almost as if they could smell it, but they couldn't figure out where the food was. And I've done multiple attempts at trying to come up with something other than frozen mices. And to date, I've been unsuccessful. You know what, though? You, you, you and all of the veteran seahorse keepers and breeders get full credit for even getting seahorses to eat frozen. I mean, we could be in a case like a dwarf seahorse keeper that has to constantly have a live food available. So still A plus and you're awesome. You know, someday we'll get there maybe, but I know, again, with the Barbori, they wanted to see the eyeballs and see that it was a shrimp. So again, uh, I, we've talked about this many times. I would personally say if you're in the U.S., Erectus are the easiest. Captive bred Erectus seahorses eat peanut butter jelly sandwiches. All right. Okay. Um, and kind of kind of jumping back and forth, guys. Sorry. But what if there are other fish in the tank besides seahorses? Will they still get crazy for food? So I think that was when we were talking about competition. And when there are more seahorses in the tank, they'll go after the food crazy because they're following each other. Does that count if it's other fish? And how could that differ? That, that could be a detriment because they may stay away from the food because of the fish. Because okay. um, a lot of the fish are very fast swimming when they attack the food. Um, but then again, you may get the occasional seahorse that uh, just doesn't care. But I think most seahorses will shy away from the food while the other fish are feeding. I agree 100%. I've got a couple uh, bad, bad word. <laughs> we'll just say that. Uh, bad boys that will go after something no matter what's going after the food. They want it and they're going to fight for it. But most seahorses will get very stressed. I just agree completely. Got to be careful about other fish you put in the tank too. Go go watch last week's Tank Mates too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, agree. Um, different story. And let's see... Okay, I think this was about when we were talking about the temperature of water that you add to the tank. Would you just use a tank, a heater, if your water's really cold, Marina? Yeah. Um, that or I actually, if I'm in a bit of a hurry, um, I just boil some RO water. So you'll boil our, our... Go ahead. Yeah, I just boil some RODI water. And then mix and it in the salt bucket? Um, I get the uh, row to the, the right temperature first and then add salt. Gotcha. Okay. Perfect answer. Okay. Does anybody want to say... Sorry, go ahead. I, well, because I have the same issue with water being too cold. And when I actually mix the salt water for a, for a water change in the tank, I have to do it at that time to have warm enough water. So what I'll do, I mix my salt in five gallon increments in a five gallon bucket. So I figured out I need like a gallon and a half of hot water and then the rest I can fill with cold water to make it the right temperature. And then I treat it for chloramines because I don't have RO. I have to use tap water and then treat it for chloramine to mix my salt water. If I'm doing like a small water change in the fry tanks, what I do is I'll actually put the um, ready-made salt water that I've already made in a cooking pot on the stove and I have a gun that reads the temperature. I'll turn the stove on to medium and just stand right there and read the temperature till it's 70 degrees, which is where I keep my tanks and then I use it. So. Awesome. 
and I heard Whatever Dan cracking <laughs> open a bottom bottle. <laughs> Not a bottle. I heard Dan <laughs> cracking open a bottle. And hey, guys, um, I am still here. It's just if I've got to talk to the kids or something, I turn off my cam. So I am still here. Um, but hey, anybody want to say really quickly what needs to happen if you're if you're like home is just too cold and you need the tank to stay up above a certain degrees, do you just add a heater or does it need covered? What? Well, insulating the tank will go a long ways in helping, but if the house itself is cool, you may have to resort to a heater. The key is, is to either put it in the sump or make sure it's protected so the seahorses can't hitch to it. I'm talking to you, all you reefers that are starting seahorse tanks. Dan Ryan, yes, I said your names. <laughs> but yeah, don't stick a heater. I, obviously, you guys know better anyways, and you guys are going to probably have sumps. But for anybody else who's watching, make sure that you don't have a heater in the actual seahorse display tank because if they wrap around it, and they will, they'll get burned and hurt. Okay, just wanted to make that point. All right. And yes, the uh, Asterina, I always say it wrong, Asternia, Asterina, however you say it. They're a pest. They killed your clam. I'm so sorry to hear that. That sucks. Okay, how about a pistol shrimp in with Erectus? Um, Alyssa on her website said that that was seahorse safe. And I have a goby, a watchman goby. He does fine, but I'm hesitant. I wondered about a pistol shrimp in with Erectus. Guys? The, how long you want to keep it? <laughs> the, well, the org has him listed as a threat level one, which is generally considered safe. I've kept a pistol shrimp in a tank for one year with no problem, uh, along with a goby. And the cool thing was, is you could hear that thing snap multiple times every day. A pistol shrimp? I had one I could hear. It was before I had the seahorses. And it, unfortunately, when we were evacuated for a month, a couple years back, I lost everything in that tank. So I lost the pistol shrimp, but I, ne I never had it with seahorses, but it did fire off that pistol, that click a few times. It was really loud. And I don't know, can that hurt the seahorses or no, that sound? Well, if you read uh, Paul Anderson's thing, you know, he'll tell you that sound and vibrations are bad for seahorses, but we had no problems in the tank. Okay. Um, it was our misfit tank that we set up to a quasi display tank. And we probably had about 10 seahorses in a 75 gallon at the time. And he presented no issue. He, he stayed buried yeah. and hidden all the time. Okay. Yeah. That would be my only worry about it is that sound because it didn't seem like something to me that would really hurt the seahorses. Well, well, I never had a pistol shrimp in a seahorse tank. But, uh, oh, maybe 12 years ago, maybe a bit more, I put a, a cleaner shrimp and moved out of one of my reef tanks into the seahorse tank. This is a full-size cleaner shrimp. It wasn't more, than, I can't remember for sure, maybe a day, two days, and the reed eye just ripped them apart and ate to pieces. Oh, jeez. Wow. Yeah, yeah that cleaner shrimp can be bad to add to a seahorse tank. I've had... One customer that was actually my bookkeeper, I gave her uh, two reed eye, uh, which they weren't big. They were about three and a half, four inches in size. She put them in a 30 gallon bio cube. And after about three or four months, she came to work one day and she said, uh, her seahorses died. So I, we waited a couple of weeks. I gave her a couple more and the same thing happened. And then on the third time I said, instead of me just giving these two, let me come take a look at the tank. And I saw the, the uh, cleaner shrimp and I asked her about it. And she had added the cleaner shrimp. Two weeks later, the seahorses died. And the problem was in a small tank like that, they were trying to clean the seahorses and stressing them out. Great points. So yeah. if you're going to add other things, have a bigger tank. Go bigger, always. Um, I will say Alyssa has been keeping seahorses for a long time and breeding seahorses. And she is very good. She learned from Dan, frankly, and I mean, she is very good. And, and so, you know, you can absolutely trust what she says. Um, and I think the only part that would go into it is the risk tolerance level. Like I personally would never add a uh, cleaner shrimp or pistol shrimp or any of those things that you just talked about, because I'd be worried that they would, the cleaner shrimp would irritate the seahorse or whatnot. But, you know, 
I guess it's where I stand on it. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. Were you going to say something, Holly? Oh, I was just saying the cleaner shrimp freak me out. They would stress <laughs> me out. I saw at a well, local aquarium shop, they had some in the shop. He sticks his hand in and they all jump on his hand. <laughs> you, you know, and I could just see him doing that to the seahorse and stressing them out. Yep. Trying and, to clean them because they're very active. And they're so cool. They're so cool. Like in a reef tank, oh, yeah. I always have a cleaner shrimp. But... <laughs> Seahorses are just different. They're not harder. They're just different. You have to set it up different. You know, that's the bottom line. Okay. I need to get through these uh, questions. And <clears throat> so I hope we covered that for you. Um, you D, we want you to come back and uh, get more ideas for the tank. We want you to beat Ryan. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, Ryan. Sorry. <laughs> All right. And Limpet Hitchhiker. Okay. I'm having problems with my seahorse getting some kind of bacterial infection on their tail. Um, treating for one. Fashion Girl 173, can you give us a few more details? I'm actually working on a document um, to help people that are trying to treat for bacterial infections. But um, unfortunately, guys, when we say, can you give us more details, like we've been talking about all night, it's not because we're trying to pick you apart at all. It's because, you know, it might be something, as Dan said. He, he worked with this woman two, three times, sold her seahorses, something was going wrong. And based on the tank size, the maintenance, everything was right. He had to figure out because she didn't tell him that there was a cleaner shrimp in there. And that was the problem. So um, we want to help you. Can we get more details? Um, and Heather, <laughs> Heather, hi. I'm so sorry um, that I didn't see your name. Sorry. And I hope I got your question on there. Pistol shrimp, right. Hey guys, what's the shrimp mantis shrimp? Don't do a mantis shrimp in a seahorse tank. All right, y'all. I'm sure you know that, but don't do that. Okay. And right, D, pyramid snails, right, gotcha. Killed the clam. Ugh, hate them. Okay. And and seahorse source, um, I'm just seeing that I'm sorry, I, I only look at the questions when I can get away from looking at the screen, so I apologize. But um, did she ever answer? about joining or no she she's going to call me after the stream okay perfect well please you know if you don't ever want to like join the actual stream because you don't want to put it out there that's fine no problem but we would love if you posted later um and told us what happened or whatnot because this is something everybody faces you're not alone you're not doing anything wrong probably or if it's something little that you just didn't know you don't know how many people are making the same mistake so we just always hope that you'll come back and share later and let us know for sure. But definitely Dan's the guy to go to. Uh, Mermaid's Reef, am I pr pronouncing it correctly? Chintons? Chintons. That sounds right. I'm going to look it up after the stream. Okay. And guys, I'm, I'm kind of like rambling going through this. What, if, what else have I missed? I'm trying to look at all these questions. I know you're answering them at the time. D asked about copepods. I'm not sure if that was about, oh, he was probably trying to answer my questions. But does anybody want to say, do copepods work? Copepods don't work as cleanup crew, right? Um, and they don't really work as a feed source, correct? No, I disagree. They do work as a part of a cleanup crew. They just not, they don't have as much of a significant impact as uh, larger stuff do. So if you're going to use copepods as part of your cleanup crew, maybe keep them in the sump where the seahorses can't eat them or... No, you can put them in the tank. A lot of seahorses will actually ignore them because they're so small. Yeah. Now, if you have too many copepods and they do eat them, I have had people had the problem where they go off frozen because they're trying to survive off the copepods. Mm -hmm. And the problem is there's not enough mass, so they'll slowly starve feeding on them. But most of the time, you always have copepods in a tank anyway, right. Right. whether you see them or not. Sure. And having some in the tank, something like Tisby or something that's a omnivore that will you know, eat different things. Um, you know, they'll eat smaller particles of food that are left over. Absolutely. Yeah, I think they do eat algae too. Don't they eat algae a little bit? The it depends. It depends upon which which species of copepods you have. You know, there's some that only eat um, the microalgae that's in the water column. Those won't survive in the tank very long. Uh, the ones that'll survive in the tank are the ones that will feed on. You know, they're more of an um, omnivore and feed on anything that's available. We need to get... People 
Mandarin Dragonette, and I've had um, Tigger Pods in my tank forever. That's what the Mandarin Dragonette eats. And I see them on the glass all the time, is why I'm asking that. So I'm thinking they might be eating algae off the glass, maybe. Yeah, they'll eat multiple different things. Um, Tigger Pods can be great for some tanks. I don't like them with fry, though. Can you tell why? Well, I've had I've seen pictures of them actually clinging onto the fry, mm-hmm. and uh, stressing the fry out. I had them jumping on them uh, the adult sea horses. After after that, never had them in again. Gotcha, um, and yeah, they just show up in my tank whenever they feel like it. But they're they're definitely good. They've made all the points. I won't repeat them. Um, and I was going to say, Dylan, you're using Carib Sea Life Rock. It's dipped in something, bacteria, and but it's dry rock, painted to look like live rock. I've never used it, guys. Is is that good? I'm guessing it is. If it, it uh, what do you guys if think? If it's painted, it's not going to work like live rock because if it's painted, uh, it closes so- off the pathway to the interior of the rock for for the anaerobic uh, bacteria. Good point. I'm curious about that now. Um, Would love to talk to you on the side, Dylan, because yeah, what Ray said makes sense, but I'm sure they thought of that and and figured something out for it, surely, right? I don't know. Let's talk on the side. All right, I'm trying to look. And Alyssa, or Lisa, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, guys. I'll figure out your name soon, I promise. (laughs) Okay. And <clears throat> Nicole was acclimating Molly's to salt water for cleanup crew. And let's see, I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Already pregnant. I'm sorry, guys. I'm reading the questions later, so I see things like, "Did he get dwarfs that were already pregnant?" Oh, oh, I know what you're talking about now. When we were talking about the gentleman who's succeeding with dwarfs, sure, that's a good point. But if he's got only Gorgonians, only plastic hitches. Um, I'm betting he's doing a, an A-OK job. It's just, it's hard because you can't add cleanup crew to cover for you when you're slacking on maintenance. Um, and I'm sure that's what he was after because I would be too. Um, but yeah, with, with dwarf seahorses, they're like fry and you just, yeah. Okay. Ray, okay. Ray was talking about Jerry Gunn came up with the system. Gotcha. Okay, and Dylan said, and we were kind of talking about this already, I plan to feed my seahorses mices two times a day, then have copepods in the tank for them to snack on. Um, do you think that will work? I want them to eat the mices. Is there any, and you guys, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to step away for like 10 seconds, so I'm going to hand it over. Dan, you're in charge now, but cover that question in detail. Is, is there any way to qualify how many cop- and we need to get Chad from Reef Nutrition back here, but is there any way to qualify how many copepods you should add to not have too many or how to make sure they're still eating the frozen and i'm going to hand it over to you and i'll be back in one minute okay fashion girl would like to join if she can uh, okay uh, dan can let her in yeah we we've, we've talked um let her in. all she has to do is text me or uh email me and i'll send her the link yeah um, message I gave, I gave the uh my my phone number as well as my email yeah, but it'd be great if she actually jumped in here and we talked live, right. if that's possible. Sure. Okay. Right. That's what I said. If she'll text me or or email me, I'll send her the link. Or me. Uh, that's fine. But I'll, I'll, okay, I'll be right back, guys. Go. All right. So adding copepods to the tank. If you're buying copepods, odds are if you buy something like the uh, small batches that they sell, uh, I doubt that that's going to have a significant impact. Um now, if you, on the other hand, if you buy a tremendously large quantity like breeders sometimes do, then that may have a detrimental impact. Because generally speaking, uh, if the seahorses will eat the copepods, they're going to decimate them so fast, it, um, they're just not going to be around very long. And think about it. When you're talking about copepods, think of how many copepods it takes to equal one mysis shrimp. And that gives you an idea of the number of copepods it would take to support a seahorse. Uh, if they can eat a half a cube of, of a single seahorse can eat a half a cube of mices, think of how many copepods it would take to equal that. Um, even large copepods are not generally large enough. Um, the larger species are often parasitic, 
Um, most of your copepods are going to be well below 1,000 microns, most of them below 500 microns. So um, I generally don't see them as a big food source for most seahorses. But now that Kelly's gone, what else? How big is uh, an amphipod in microns? I don't know in, in microns, but they're, they're much bigger. And some amphipods are actually as big as mice and shrimp. So uh, amphipods are a very good uh, thing to add. And in fact, it's probably one of the, the uh, most treasured foods for seahorses besides live mice. Um, there are places, I know Algigen at, at times was selling live uh, amphipods. Um, I don't know who else sells them. They are a bit hard to find, but a lot of times people will find them in their tanks. And if you can find another hobbyist that has some and set up a refugium, that's the thing to do. You'll get an occasional amphipod in the tank doing it that way. Okay, I'm back, guys. I'm sorry if I, what, for what I missed, but I just read the comment that someone had a cleaner shrimp that was pulling eggs from the male while he was sleeping. Holy coly moly. I've heard of that before. Ugh. And I'm curious, is there anything else? Like I've had pepper, peppermint shrimp in all my seahorse tanks and never had that kind of problem. But are there other shrimp that will do that? Um, that wasn't peppermint. That was a cleaner shrimp that was doing that. And that, um, right. No, I've never I'm seen, saying, I've, I've never seen peppermint shrimp being a problem. Okay, good. All right. And I'm just trying to get through all the questions before we cover what we think, um, is good or bad. Okay. I noticed uh, mm -hmm. fashion girl, I'm going to quit reading her messages because hopefully you'll be able to join. I don't know if you've messaged Dan yet or not. But again, if you cover it on the side, please just come back and let us know or post on, on, the, on my page and let us know what you figured out and if it worked. Um, however, if you can come jump in, feel free. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, you said you could join, so hopefully you will. And Dylan said, Carib Sea Life Rock is man-made rock, very porous, but it's dry rock, no hitchhikers. However, it's dipped in, right. And Dylan, I know what you're talking about, and I love it, and I, I know what you're saying, that it's dipped in bacteria, which is good, so it makes it like live rock, but it's not, it's clean. Um, the only thing that Ray was really talking about is the fact that if it's painted, that might be a problem. So I'm curious about that part of it. Um, and then I think we're finally getting to the end. Team D, for sure. Ryan didn't show up tonight, so we're all about Team D, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Oh, and I need to turn my webcam back on. You're talking to a no face. Sorry. All right. And then the paint doesn't hurt the bacteria. I know it doesn't hurt, but I think Ray's point was that if if the holes in the rock are covered by paint, then bacteria can't get in there. It's not porous anymore if it's painted over. So I'm, I'm betting that they have a, a system set up to where they uh, overcome that, but I'm just not sure what it is. Someone said, sexy shrimp with dwarf seahorses or any other CUC. What about sexy shrimp, you guys? I doubt it. Why? I've heard of people doing it, but I don't know if I, I myself haven't, so I can't say from experience uh, on that. Ray, why'd you say no? Just from uh, what's in my head from many years of uh, reading posts here or there, when sexy shrimp have been brought up, <clears throat> I just uh, don't think it would be suitable. Gotcha. Well, and, and, I'll, and I'll say this, guys. We come together every Wednesday to not only get together and drink, yay, um, but also help anybody who wants help and share that information. But you have to always remember, Dan might do things differently than Cheryl does. I might do things differently than Holly. As long as you're talking to people that have been successful long term, and kind of have an idea of what they're talking about, not some store that's telling you, yeah, throw them in a reef tank, um, you're still getting good advice. And Dan has pointed out numerous times that it's all about your risk tolerance level. Um, it's, do you care more about having a beautiful tank or do you care more about making sure your seahorses 
thrive and sur not just survive but thrive long term. Some people will have different answers to that and there's nothing wrong with that. It's what you want out of your tank, you know. So I'm super careful and snail girl over here and uh, Holly gets away with crabs. I would never put a crab in my seahorse tank. And Holly, you've never had a problem, right? No, uh-uh. So I, I'm definitely not saying she's wrong. You just get every, you get people from different backgrounds sharing on Wine Wednesday what, you know, what they do, what works, and then you have to weigh the pros and cons of each decision is my, my personal take on it. And Dylan said, how do feel, seahorses feel on your hand? Most fish feel slimy. Do seahorses feel slimy? No, not, not at, all. at all. Dan, why don't they feel slimy? Because they're not. <laughs> <laughs> they have an outside skeleton so they're actually pretty hard yep and they'll curl it we talked last uh, go, ahead, Mar go ahead marina they feel sort of bony yeah and and we talked whether it was a, le a week or a week two weeks ago i can't remember but we talked about when a seahorse if you have to grab a seahorse in order to apply any medication or you know whatever a lot of times they'll make that clinkety clink bone chilling noise that you kind of feel more than hear. everybody know what i'm talking about i haven't heard that yet dan you have right oh yeah yeah and is that when they're ticked off or what he's sorry i'm trying to put an address in for um Okay, I'll quit. I'll quit calling on you then. But uh, it's one thing, I, a defense a mechanism, I would imagine, of some kind. Agreed, Holly. If you're grabbing on a seahorse <laughs> instead of them grabbing on you, and the clinkety clink bone clinking sound feeling that you get, like they're literally making some noise that you kind of feel more than here. I can't even describe it better than that. But bottom line is, I agree. It's usually a defense mechanism if you're in that kind of situation where you're pulling on them instead of them pulling on you. Um, but, uh, I just, I think they, I think they can speak to each other too. I mean, I think they make noises to each other. They're not whales. <laughs> this, uh, this is not scientific y'all, but did any of the rest of you think they can make noises that the others can hear? I don't know. I think it's probably possible. Okay. So they all think I'm nuts. That was not uh, advice on Wine Wednesday, y'all. <laughs> it's just my personal crazy thought. But I swear they communicate. I, I'm telling you. Okay. They, I don't know if it's verbal, but <laughs> they do communicate. You can tell. Okay. And just back on the comments, Mermaid's Reef said on the Carib Sea rock, it's not really like paint. It's more like the rock is stained purple. And the pink just starts outside. I've heard good things. Okay, cool. And we want updates. Let us know, um, Dylan, and if Mermaid Reef, if you use it, we want to know how it works out for you because I have not personally used it, so I can't give advice, but I've heard good things too. Um, the paint comment was good. What? Kelly, what was that rock called again? It was, oh gosh, now you're going to make me, me scroll up and get lost. Um, somebody repeat the name. It was Carib Sea, but there was a specific name for this rock that's dipped. It's dipped in bacteria. So that life it's, rock? what was it? Is it life rock? Carib sea life rock? I think you're right. Thank you, Marina. You're awesome. Okay. And uh, I don't know if this person just jumped in, but we'll cover it again. No problem. Uh, CUC for a dwarf tank. Anyone? Okay. So, and Inland Mermaid is coming in. Great. Well, I will answer that question um, with cleanup crew in a dwarf tank, it's a lot different from the large seahorse species tanks because they're like fry. And, you know, you've already got to feed them live foods and you've already got to make sure that, you know, you don't have any aptasia. You want that in every seahorse tank, but in a dwarf seahorse tank, it's much more serious because it, they're small. Everything affects them more. So literally in a dwarf seahorse tank, most people don't keep cleanup crew. They do the cleanup themselves. Anybody got anything to add to that? Is there any cleanup crew for a dwarf or fry tank besides mice and shrimp, which Dan covered earlier? I'm going to take that as no. Go ahead, Dan. Um, not that I know of. Um, we also have uh, 
I think it's Fashion Girl now. Inland, Inland Mermaid has joined us. Welcome, welcome. And if you're in, you might have to unmute yourself if you want to talk. I know yeah, when somebody joins that hasn't joined before, we got to give them a second to figure it out. Yep. Can you hear us okay? It, okay, if you can hear us, make sure that you've joined with your audio. And uh, then, okay, and the, right, you're playing with your video, which is cool. Figure that out. And then there should be one for audio. And you just got to make sure that you've allowed audio on your phone or computer. And you have to unmute it in order to speak. And I'll talk while you're figuring it out, just so we don't aren't silly. All right. And Dee said it's life, rock, real. Now with the words that I'm not going to pronounce right. <laughs> Aragonic. Aragonic. Is that correct? Correct, you guys? Okay. Base rock, not cement, no curing. Extensive macro and micro porosity infused with spored bacteria for outstanding biological performance. Clean and safe for all fish. There you go. There's your answer. It's not paint, as Mermaid's Reef said. It's stain, and it works. And I want to try it now. I'm about to set up a new tank. Maybe I'll get in that competition with Dee and uh, Ryan. <laughs> all right. And... Used it right. Okay, gotcha. All right. <laughs> no, and you did a good job, Dylan, trying to explain it. You know, I'm on my third class. It's all good. It's all good. Hey guys, by the way, while we're waiting to see if um, in the mermaid can uh, connect and and share with us, I was going to mention we're we're considering doing something on New Year's Eve. Not specifically related to seahorses, more about people, your your favorite influencers on YouTube um, and, and Instagram and those plays, Facebook. Uh, so if that's something you'd like to see, a live stream with your favorites that cover all sorts of topics all over the place, you know, let me know, message me, get in the comments. But yeah, we're, we're I'm trying to talk D into being a co-host, so had to had to bring it up. <laughs> all right. Okay, Inland Mermaid, are you have audio connected now? Mm. Are you talking with her via message, Dan? No, but it uh, said that I saw a message that popped up that she was connecting to audio. Okay, sometimes it takes a sec. Inland Mermaid, if you can hear us, when you do have audio, just speak up and we'll hear you. Yep, even if I'm talking, rambling, uh, interrupt me for sure. Because we want to, we love when new people join. We, I was hoping Chris would come back this week because we love to help people and, you know, definitely hear, or, or even someone who's doing really well. He messaged me, Kelly. Okay. He said something happened Saturday. He has to sell both his aquariums. He's losing his place, sounds like. So he says he's asking for prayers for him and his family. Oh my gosh. Well, hang on. I just saw your message, Fashion Girl. Moment of silence for Chris. <clears throat> prayers to you for your family for sure. So sorry to hear that. No problem. You didn't weren't able to come, and I will definitely be saying prayers on the site. I'm so sorry to hear that. Okay, so I'm trying to talk to Miss Fashion Girl via Messenger. Um, and I'm going to say it out loud, which is kind of odd, but what are you seeing? Like, as far as audio, you might have to go back out and come back in with the same link. And when you first join, it's going to ask you, do you give permission for your audio and your video? That's what it should do. And Dan, we played with the phone. I think she's on a phone. Um, so which option should she choose? Um... Don't know. Let's see. Um, okay, so you okay. join with a video. I think I gave. Um, let me connect here. Sorry, guys. We love we love visitors, so we're gonna try to figure this out. Um, Miss Mermaid, okay. sorry. Go ahead. Call using internet audio. Turn that microphone off. And you should be able to hear me. Yes, we can. And so you said when you logged in, 
to the, the thing. It, and it says, uh, Miss Mermaid, that you are connecting to audio and now it says you're connected. Can you speak? Yay. Yes, I can you hear me. Woo! She's in. Yay. All right. <laughs> okay. So if oh, you want to turn right. your camera on, you can. You don't have to, though. Okay. But let us know what's up. Okay. So go ahead and give us a synopsis of what, what's happened so far. So about, let me see if I can find out how to turn the camera on. But um, about a month ago, one of my male Cuda seahorses, I noticed he had a, what his, the tip of his tail was a bit white. So I kind of kept an eye on it because I wasn't sure what it was. So about a week later, it looked a bit worse. So I messaged Cheryl on Facebook and sent her some pictures. She had said it looked like a uh, bacterial infection. So I switched him to a hospital tank and treated him with Fauna 2 and the triple sulfa. Uh -huh. And it seemed like it got better. Um, and once it's like the tail seemed like it got better, I put him back in the, in the display tank. But he was in the hospital tank for almost probably three weeks or so. And when I put him back in the tank, I noticed he wasn't eating. He pretty much he, he died. And so now my female seahorse has the same thing. So I decided to put all my three seahorses that I have left in the hospital tank and treat them for the same thing. But I just don't know what it is. I know Ray said it could be tail rot and due to water quality, but I do a water change every single week. So, and then when I check the water parameters seem fine. So I don't know if I am doing something wrong. The only thing I, I could think of is that I do have those bristle worms in there and I do pull them out, but I don't know what else it could be. I've had them for a year and that's never happened till now. Okay. Um, how big is your tank? It's a 50 gallon. And how many, sea, you had four seahorses total in there? Four one in time? total, yes. Okay. And how's your flow rate? Um, I actually have a little, I have a pump, but I don't turn it on all the time. Um, I don't know how many gallons, how many, uh, I don't know how much, uh, water is it a good, strong flow? It is. Okay. And do you have a protein skimmer? I do. Okay. Temperature of the tank. I have it at 70 to like right now it's at 70 just cause I don't have a, I turn the heater off right now in the cool weather. That's fine. Um, do you have, what do you have for a substrate? Uh, it's sand. And what else is in the tank besides the seahorses? I have uh, two little clown, two clownfish, and you guys were talking about shrimps. I have a those red shrimps. I think it's a fire shrimp, and I've okay. had him. I've had him in there since I've got my two Cuda seahorses. Okay. Um, I never see him picking at them. He's always hiding. I also do have a um, mandarin and a sand sniffing, uh, sifting starfish. Okay. Um, how long have you had the Cuda? Uh, I bought them from you about a year and a half. I want to say now. Okay. You've had them a while. Yes. Um, right now it's just the one female that's showing the symptoms. Well, first it was the male. So it's my two, the, the two first seahorses I purchased and first it was a male. He seemed better. I put him back. Um, he wasn't eating. He seemed stressed. Um, so I put him back in the, in the hospital tank and probably lasted a week after I put him back in there. So, but now it's my female seahorse. Okay. What? Uh, um, the, how, when you treated with the Furon 2 and the triple sulfa, how were you doing it? So I did, Cheryl told me to do, um, so I did a whole packet of each in a 10 gallon, the hospital takes a 10 gallon and yep. I do a water change every day. I do 50% water change. And yep. so when I do the 50% water change, I put half of uh, each, uh, of each, of each of the treatments. That's correct. Um, and how long in total did you treat the male? The male, he was in there probably a total of three weeks. Okay. Um, and right now, you have one female with a tail that's yes. turning white. Yes. And so like the, I noticed the tip now that it used to be really skinny, but it looks like the skinny part might've fallen off. I don't yeah. know if I, I don't know if it'll that show happens. if I, okay. Let me see if I can turn the camera on and 
Yeah, turn it around. And I, I don't mean to interrupt at all because you yeah. you guys are getting the honor of seeing Dan at work. This is what you get if you call him directly. For sure, it's awesome. But I was, my only question was, was the male seahorse eating while he was in treatment and then stopped when he got in, back um, in the tank? He was. Let me see if I can. I don't know if I can. Zoom you make in. her full screen. Kelly? Yes, I sure will. Sorry, you could have too, Dan, but I will. <laughs> Sorry, I know you're you're at work. I know. Okay. Um, oh, you're both. The big. male, okay. the male was eating, um, <clears throat> not till like the last week or so he stopped eating. Oh, I just I never I didn't notice him eating after that. Okay. You want me to make her bigger? Get you out. Uh, if you can. Okay. If you can. Cause am I able to zoom in on here? I don't know. No, it's not you. It was me there. Okay. okay. Now you're big. There's what I want. Okay. okay. So the female I see her now, she's pointed downward. Are the other yes. two eating correctly at the moment? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, they're fine. They just like, they've all turned pretty much dark. They're not yep. yellow. Like they were. Do, do you have a hitching post in that tank? I, ha I have that fake plan in there. Do they hitch to it? Uh, she does, and they also hitch on, on around this okay. air thing. Okay. The other thing you might want to do on your tank is take a towel and wrap it around three sides of the tank. Okay. They'll they'll feel more secure and more uh, protected by not seeing out as as much. Um, okay. Is the female currently eating? She does eat. Okay. Good. Um, which part of the country are you in? I'm in California. Do you have access to live brine shrimp? I don't know. I'm sure I can find someone, see if I can figure out who might have live brine shrimp. If they have live brine shrimp, my suggestion would be to gut load the brine shrimp with the antibiotics because it has a faster impact in treating them. Um, okay. At the moment, looking at the water, I'm guessing you don't, do not have antibiotics in the water as we speak. There is. It's actually kind of yellow. Okay. Um, yeah. I Should it be the, more yellow? No, uh, that's fine. You got Furon 2 and, and triple sulfur. And the triple, yes. Okay. I'd like you to look and get two more things if possible. Okay. Uh, one is Metrodiazinol and Metroplex by Seachem. Um, there's a couple of other different brand names, but the ingredient is Metrodiazinol. Okay. And I'd like to add that to the antibiotics as you're already doing. Do the recommended dose for 10 gallons the first time, 50% each day after that. And the reason okay. for that is tail rot can be from, um, it's typically a bacterial infection, but sometimes it can be a secondary thing to your anema. And what we're trying to do with the metrodiazinol is kill off the uranema and the antibiotics are attacking the, the wound itself. Um, okay. The other thing I'm going to recommend is that if you go to Amazon and order some Alimax liquid. Okay. It's A L L I M A X. Okay. Alimax is a. Um, it's going to be oh. a little dropper. I want you to get the liquid. It's a little dropper bottle. And okay. essentially, what we do with that is we, once a day, you will lift the seahorse out of the tank take a dry paper towel and gently dry the tail, pat it dry. Okay. Put one drop right directly on where the tail's white. Let it sit for about 10 to 15 seconds and then put the seahorse back in the tank. Okay. Alimax has Allison in it. And Allison is a part of the garlic uh, that is very good at treating um, bacterial infections, it can kill parasites, it can treat fungal infections, and it's a very unstable product, but there's a doctor in England who figured out how to stabilize it, and it's very potent at treating uh, wounds. And okay. um, she, that once, once they lose the tail, the tail will not grow back. Okay. But she can live with what she already, you know, has lost. I've seen seahorses live with no tail before. So oh, wow. If we okay. can stop the infection and keep it from progressing, then um, she'll do just fine, you know, even without the tail. Okay. The so do tail. you think, so as of now on the 50 gallon, I usually do a 10, um, 10 gallon water change every week. Should I be doing more than that? Um, if it is the, the water? 
I don't know that it's necessarily the water. I, you know, I can't, we don't know what the cause is. I don't have a specific thing that I can sit here and say it's this, that, or the other. Um, okay. Because you've done you a had, great job. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. If okay. I had access to probiotics, I would add probiotics to the tank. And right okay. now, the only person I know that has probiotics is you could message Todd Ragsdale on the group. From Hawaii? Yes. yes. Uh, okay. He did have some probiotics. And if so, then I would consider adding probiotics to the tank while you're treating these guys and do so until you run out of it. Like do it in the hospital tank or in the main no. tank? The main tank. The okay. The it's kind of pointless putting probiotics in a tank with antibiotics. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, but it wouldn't hurt to put it in the main tank because if you do have bad bacteria in there, the probiotics will compete against it. But okay. you know, my suspicion is is that you're probably you're probably dealing with a uranema type infection, which is a parasitic infection, and you have a secondary bacterial infection. And okay. the idea of the probiotics is to, the uranema feeds on organic matter in the water and the probiotics will compete against them for the food and will try to knock back that population. Okay. I just wanted to give a shout out real quick and say that uh, everything Dan just covered, I will provide a document like I did last week when Ray um, shared the deworming. Um, I, I made sure there was a document that we posted in the comments. So if you didn't catch all that, you can rewind, of course, but I will definitely put up a document. Sorry, go ahead, ma'am. Nope, no worries. Um, did you have any other questions? No, that was it. I was just worried. I wasn't sure if the same situation was going to happen as it did with the mail. Um, like I said, with the mail, it did kind of look like it healed. I'm guessing he was just really stressed afterwards. I don't know, but he uh, he didn't make it. If I'm correct in my guess, if this is in fact a uranema type thing that's creating a secondary bacterial infection, what can happen is you can treat the wound and fix the wound, but there's still stuff going on inside the seahorse. Got it. And when they stop eating, that's usually not a good sign. And okay. quite often when they stop eating, there's damage that's being done internally and it's if you can get them back eating sometimes you know the damage isn't too bad you can save them but quite often okay. at that point that's the prognosis is not real good okay now i did put the other two male seahorses in there just because i got worried thinking if there is a bacteria in there maybe that's why she got it from the other should i put them back in the main display or leave them in there with her no, let's leave them in there because I want the metrodiazinol metro has a impact on uranema. And if that is in fact the case, then I think it's a good idea to go ahead. You know, otherwise you may end up three, four weeks from now, have the same thing with another seahorse. Let's go okay. ahead and treat them all, be done with it and move forward. Dan, so okay. do, you, do you recommend metro instead of furon 2 and triple when it's whitetail no. rot or all three? All three, in okay. addition to. Did you have another question? Are you able to text me that, Dan? Those those items, those other medications yes. I should purchase? Yes. Okay, awesome. Yeah. yeah and I'll like I that. said, guys, I'll make sure there's a document too, but go ahead, Dan, sorry. That's all right. No, I'll be happy to. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys. Sure. And yeah. while you're still here, wait, if you don't mind, I have a few questions, if that's cool, well, y'all. Yeah. Be yes, before, before you do, okay. Kelly, okay. Um, you got my phone number. Um, if you need to call me along the way, call me and we'll go over things as things progress. Sounds good, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. First yep. of all, I want to say you have the best help there is because Dan literally has run a helpline for seahorses for ever. And he, you know, we all try to help and we're all pretty good, but he is the best and he will walk you through it and help you. Sorry to toot your horn, Dan, well, but you won't. So I he's will. been very helpful <laughs> since I purchased them. <laughs> yes. And and that was my other question. Just to Just to be clear. Because you had them for how long before this happened? This uh, occurred? About a year and a half, okay. maybe going on two years. Right. And um, with the male, you already mentioned that he was eating during the treatment phase. And another point you brought up that everybody should know is if you're treating seahorses for anything, they very likely will turn dark. She had a really good setup for a hospital tank. It doesn't have to be detailed, um, but you want to make sure they have hitches and, you know, oxygenation, bubbler, et cetera. She had a perfect, you did, a, I just applaud you um, for you. doing everything <laughs> that you can. Yeah, hang on, I'll make you big screen here because we want to see your big tank too. 
Um, oh yeah, I can show you where they yeah their normal home. Yeah, I want to see that. And hang on, let me put you big. Uh, maybe, maybe not. All right, here we go. Let me spotlight that's the, you. That's the fifty working? gallon. Let me see if I can make the light brighter. Here we go. Let me see if it works. Spotlight for everyone. All right, now you're big. And okay, that's so the, in the fifty gallon, you, does it have a sump too? Yes, it does. Okay. I'm doing a water change tonight, so it's like in the way, <laughs> but I do have a thumb. <laughs> hey, you're you're one of the only people that gets in here and actually shows your tanks. We appreciate you. You're awesome. Oh, and I love the I love the aquascape. That's like seahorse paradise right there. <laughs> well, and that was that was my other thing. So I had more of a Tonga rock, and I noticed that there I was getting those little feather um, worms. I don't. Oh. Uh, yeah, and so I was, it was, I was having tons of those. So I actually thought maybe that could have been the problem. So I pulled a lot of the rock out and I cleaned them all down. And I only put two big pieces in there and left all the other out, thinking it could have been that. But then she got it, so I wasn't sure. So real quick, um, so I'm guessing you have a sump. You don't have to show us, but what's the filtration in the sump? I'm curious. I have a skimmer, mm -hmm. a filter stock. And then I also have more rocks in the, um, okay. at the bottom. And then I have a carbon and a phosphate reactor in there too. Okay. So everybody watching, she did everything right. Sometimes stuff yep. just <laughs> happens. And I just wanted to applaud you again because I asked that question. This. What? I'm going to see if I can move this to like. Okay. Okay. Mine. And I just wanted to say, I wasn't, I, anybody who joins Wine Wednesday, we're never going to like beat you up or call you out. We'll just try to help you fix oh, things, but she's done everything right. And yeah, so this is the carbon mm -hmm. and then the phosphate and then the um, skimmers in here. And then the sock is back there. Can, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How often are you cleaning the skimmer? The skimmer, I do it every week. Okay. You, you see where the skimmer is dark underneath the collection cup? Here? Y yes. Yes. See how, see how that gets all junked up? Yes. Once that happens, depending upon the skimmer, your efficiency of that skimmer is going to drop anywhere from 10 to 50%. Okay. So instead of waiting for the cup to fill, watch the throat or the riser tube, as they call it. When that gets dirty, you want to go ahead and clean that. Um, I'm not worried about the collection cup being full or not full, but you want to keep that riser tube clean to get the maximum amount of organics out of the tank. Okay. Most people aren't aware of that. And I'm glad you showed that because I, I can't get that across enough to people. Great. Yeah, so every, every week when I do my water change, I do try to, I, I usually wipe that out with a paper towel or something because it does get really gunky. It's like, it's pretty thick. <laughs> Yeah, what I do with mine is each of my tanks has a toilet brush and I use that to uh, on my skimmers. Oh, and then okay. First, I wipe it out as much as I can. Then I hit the brush to it. But you got to watch it because the skimmer is going to go nuts afterwards. Right. So, hey, anybody watching, we're talking a lot about poop and toilet brushes. <laughs> toilet brushes, don't use the one from your toilet. All right. And I just, again, I, I was asking about the rock and the sump or the media and the filtration in the sump because you talked about um, removing rock and cleaning it. Yes. And then you're, you know, if, if there's something bad on it, you're getting rid of it, but you're also getting rid of all the good bacteria, but you have done everything right. And you had rock to help you as filtration in the sump, so bravo. And this sucks. I hate hearing that you're having problems. Um, I, I had another question. I'm trying to think of what it was. Can you go back to the seahorses in quarantine? Yes, I can. <laughs> but you, beautiful tank, though. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. And guys, is that a the, fluorescent light on the tank? Oh, Say it again. Are those fluorescent tubes on the tank? No, it's their um, LEDs. Okay, that's fine. It's a little LED one. No, that's no. I meant on the the hospital. Oh, tank. Uh, they're also LEDs. There's some like cheap ones I found at Walmart just to light it up. Yeah. I, and my husband made this wood to put it on there. Yeah. I don't know that you really need a light on the hospital tank. Okay. Um, I would definitely run it a whole lot less, but okay. one of the things you have to be careful of is a lot of antibiotics are light sensitive. And Furon 2 so, is one of them. Uh, yep. Okay. Furon 2 wow. is one of them. I know because when I did my video about it, for sure. Good. Great point, Dan. And, and I just, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry guys, but I just wanted to point out for anybody watching 
that uh, she's doing everything right. She's still had a problem. We're here to help. And that's how easy it is to set up a hospital tank. You know, people are like, oh, I don't want to go to all that trouble and blah, blah, blah. But she's just got a tank with hitches and a bubbler. I mean, that's all you need. And then the medications. It's really, you know, if you want to, if you want to take care of your seahorses, you can. And I just love your tank. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Hey, I did notice too. Uh, I don't, and and you're so you're so kind to keep showing us and, and going back and forth. I'm so sorry. No, but no, final no. question about the hospital tank is: yes. Have you changed your feeding habits? Because I saw a lot of food. Are you removing it from the bottom? There's the actually meat? there's no food in it. I think oh. it's just that um, I do remove it all when whatever doesn't get eaten. I think it's like the splash from like the dry salt are on it. Yep. On the bottom of the, it's actually on the bottom of the glass. Mm -hmm. Okay, but yeah, you back here, like, yeah, mm. it just from all the splashing, I think of the water changes. Yep. Well, you're doing everything right. The only other question I had, actually, not I don't want to keep asking you. Sorry, you're no, keep thank you for coming. <laughs> um, but Dan, so I'm curious, you're you've given the advice, and we know it's good, but what are your thoughts? I mean, these seahorses were a year and a half old, doing well. I mean, you said you don't, it's not necessarily the water. Is this something that you think, I'm just curious of your, you know, and, and to, to you, Miss Mermaid, I'm going to call you Miss Mermaid. Yes. Um, yes. Don't take anything he says from here, you know, like uh, to your brain because he's just guessing, but I'm just curious for anybody watching, Dan, are you thinking that it's some a fish she added or is it just always in the tank and it just happens? What are your thoughts about what could have happened? Not saying that that's what happened. Well, I, I think of tail rot as a stress disease. And while it's entirely possible that the other guys may have played a role, if they've been all together for a long time, I suspect that's not the case. So, you know, you, there is a possibility of it being something else entirely, but you know, I think it's underreported how many times uranema plays a role with seahorse illnesses. And uranema is one of those problems that's always in your tank. It just, it can just happen, right? Right. Well, what happens is if organics build up within a tank, their population of those guys will grow. And with seahorses, you know, they can be exposed to uranema and for a long time, they don't present a problem but you know ultimately they in the end they can and it's a it's a pain in the butt disease uh parasite because you can't see them and there's you know not only can they affect seahorses externally but they can play a role in weak snick they can play a role in um, infections in many different places and sometimes you'll see seahorses where they have a wound that appears for no reason and it's a uranema digging their way out. Um, Absolutely. And in this case, with the tail rot, you know, there's been suspicion. I've read articles before of it being suspicious that it's a cause of tail rot. And uh, I think Pete Juanja has mentioned it in some of his stuff. But in this case, I want to cover all the bases. And that's why I suggest the metrodiazinol. And so when someone has a seahorse with tail rot, uh, the one thing that surprised me um, and, and, you know, on these forums, guys, or in these groups, if we don't get all the details as Dan just did, it's easy to say, oh, just do this and not have the full details. But it surprised me. Um, would you not have told someone with this issue to put all the seahorses in a hospital tank or no? It depends upon the history. And okay. the first the first seahorse that had it, I would have done exactly what Cheryl had recommended and go. recommend treating that seahorse. In this case, we have a second seahorse that, um, you know, if you look at the timeline of how long this has been going on, you know, what I would expect to happen if she didn't do this is in the same timeline, I would expect to see the same thing happen in another seahorse or sooner. And um, it's, sorry. Yeah, and so it's already happening in one. Looking at the posture, the other guys tells me they're probably suffering from something. I just can't, you know, can't see inside of them. I don't have any diag ways of, you know, using diagnostic equipment to find out what's going on. So it's an educated guess based upon experience. Sure. And Dan will help you on the side and hopefully you guys will come back and, and share success. We hope, but share either way, because you know, this stuff happens to everybody guys. She did everything right. And 
Um, just my only, uh, I have two last questions. And the first one is when you've got, when she put the first seahorse, uh, the male, into the treatment and he seemed to get better, the first point I want to make is how important is it to make sure that you finish the medication dosage before putting him back into the tank or stopping medication? Like if you if he if he looks better, can you stop the medication and put him back in the tank, or do you need to complete the ten days? No, you need you need to complete the entire uh, ten days. You know, the ten days comes from Seahorse.org with the moderators there, and you know if you look at the directions on the medication, Furon two, for example, says treat, wait three days, do a water change, treat again, and do it two or three times. Um, the reason that Seahorse or, uh, Org went to 10 days is because in many, many cases, two things were happening. One, a lot of the medications were underdosing because they're afraid of destroying people's tanks. And secondly, um, not treating long enough, you don't necessarily kill the infection and you, you keep you know, treating for short periods, you'd end up developing bacterial, uh, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. So the reason we go the full days, full 10 days is to make sure that one, we've cleared it up and two, to prevent antibiotic resistance. Okay. And my absolute, thank you. You just nailed everything I hope to accomplish. And if you didn't get that, believe me, I'm going to put notes and I'm going to take you off full screen. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to leave you on full screen the whole time. I apologize. Um, Oh, she's put, she, okay, we're back up. Oh, no, you're good. Okay, Sorry. I'll leave it there until you want me to stop. But oh, my final <laughs> question, and then I'll stop drilling you, Dan, because I know this is how you work and this is how you help people, but I'm sure you're like, Kelly, stop putting me on the spot. So I'm so sorry. Um, but I just, I think it's such important things to see how you work and how important your work is. So final thing is the fact that she treated the male and he seemed to get better and I'm, I, I'm guessing that she did the full 10 day treatment and he seemed better. Actually, was his tail completely healed or was it still just looking kind of okay? It looked almost completely healed. Like I feel like the tip, it looked just like a lighter brown because he was also dark. I think when I put them in here, they just get really dark. Yep. Um, so it, it looked pretty much healed. Um, but it, I, I did do the full 10 days and I was thinking like, oh, it looks better. He looks like he's being stressed. I'll put him back in there. Uh, and then, yeah, and, and he seemed fine in there too for about a week. And then it, he started not doing well. So, yes. And, and thank you. And again, uh, just to, to reiterate what Dan said, um, and people don't know this, so it's a great point, is putting something around three sides of the tank helps the seahorses not be as stressed. They are going to be stressed in a hospital tank with medication. It's stressful. Come on. When you're sick and you're, you know, in the hospital or even taking medicine, you're stressed. So are seahorses. But that's a tip that most people don't know is covering three sides of the tank with whatever you got, towel, or I've used um, those fake backgrounds, whatever, just so they don't see movement going around, you know, um, around the tank around them. That helps. But Dan, my final question, and then I'll shut up about this because we appreciate you sharing. And again, everybody has these problems. It's not just you. You did everything right. But Dan, so the fact that the seahorse looked like it was better and was still eating, and she put it back into the seahorse tank. I know you already said that it doesn't always mean that there's not something internal going on, but do you think there's anything to be learned from the fact that, like, could it maybe have helped if she had left it in for another treatment or longer? Is this something in the tank, or do you just need more time to develop that theory? Uh, my suggestion probably would have been to have kept the seahorse in the tank another uh, four or five days to see how things progress. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's a tough call. And unless you're working with somebody one-on-one -on, -one on like that, right. it's going to be a very tough call. Most people want to move the, the animal back to the display tank as soon as possible. And I'm a little bit slow in doing that because of what happened here. Uh, you know, I've seen it happen in more cases than what, you know, than you would realize that, um, they're not completely healed yet. And, you know, I would have been more comfortable leaving the animal in the hospital tank for another few days. But I, you know, I'm not sitting here saying what she did was wrong. Mm -hmm. 
there are some people that would suggest going ahead and doing that. But, um, you know, sometimes I'm a little bit slow to treat an animal, but I'm also a little bit slow to move the animal back because I want to make sure that we're all clear before we do that. Sure. And, and I, I'll just say I wasn't trying to at all say that anybody was wrong here either. Believe me, guys, I've had fights with Dan where he's like, wait a minute. And I'm like, no, my seahorse is stressed. I'm putting it back. So now, I, I'm what with you. <laughs> What concerns me at the moment, though, is that as you look at these guys, the posture that they've taken right. is very concerning to me because the, the head down like that, they're not hitching and just sitting there with the head down is not a good thing to see with the seahorses. It tells me that not only does the female having a problem, but I think the other two are having an issue as well. And, and again, Dan, will, Dan is probably going to connect with you after this show and work with you on the side and do everything we can to help um and yeah that was that was my actual final question just that you know you you put the seahorse back into the main tank and it did well for a good week week and a half uh that doesn't necessarily mean anything i mean obviously you did everything right and sometimes guys this crap just happens i've lost seahorses too and it sucks so the yeah. the other thing i have in the in the tank is this uh this like filter thing but I, I have nothing in it I just put a sponge so when I feed them and I like to use it like when I mix the medication so that it like mixes in there I yep. notice that when when that's running they're hitched but when I turn it off they just go to the center and just okay hang out there I, I would go ahead and run it all the time but I would pull the sponge okay the, yeah the only reason I put the sponge was because I feel like um I'll turn it on after I feed them and it collects some of the food here and then I'll just dump the water out and then I'll remove the sponge and just let it flow the, the water in there without the food. And then I'll do my water change the next yep. day. So, so you're running it most of the time without the sponge, correct? Correct, yes. Is I only very, put it when I feed them. Right, is that a very poor sponge? Yes, it's, a, it's one of the sponges I have in their filter in the bottom of the tank too. Yeah. My, my concern is with the sponge of it removing medication. Uh, okay. Okay. Good to know. I get why you're but, doing it though for the food. Right. I do too, but yeah. I do like the idea of that, that running in addition to just the airline because it increases the circulation. I think that's good for them. Okay. Yeah. It looks like really low flow in there, um, which I get. Yeah. I, yeah. I just, I actually turned it off to earlier today, but usually I'll, I'll actually turn it off at night and then turn it off, turn it on during the day. So I don't, I don't know. In my Wait, head, I filter? think at night. So, uh, this, yeah, the filter so that it like doesn't make the water too, too much. Cause yeah. Cause they'll like, they'll swing around for a bit. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Uh, the other, the other thing that's helpful for people to know too, is that, you know, you have an air stone in the tank, but, uh, open airline will have larger bubbles and larger bubbles will move more water. So my normal recommendation is to put an airline in without an air stone. Okay. Well, there's I, nothing wrong, nothing wrong with having the air stone. It's just that you can, and if you're running the other pump, it doesn't matter. But okay. um, if you're running just an airline in the tank, I usually recommend running, you know, open airline or rigid airline tube and crank it up just a bit um, so that the water is, you know, circulating a little bit more. Okay. Gotcha. And again, I just want to say again, uh, thank you so much for coming and sharing because you are a perfect example. You did everything right. And this just sucks. And I'm crossing my fingers that Dan will be able to help you figure it out. And uh, please come back and let us know what happens. And since you're here, uh, not to jump from subject to subject, but I'm curious, what is your cleanup crew, <laughs> since that's a topic, in your reef, in your sewer tank? Crew, yes. I have, I have snails. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. I forget there which ones these are. I'm not really good with the snail's name. Um, and then I have some hermits, but I, I, there's, I only have like three or four in there. Um, and then I have my star, my sand sniff, sniffing starfish. And that's all I have in there. No, I, I hear much, you. It's pretty much snails. They're like everywhere. Right. I, I'm the same way. I'm the snail girl. I'm with you. And I, yeah. I was just curious um, because I don't keep sand in most of my tanks. So um, she, 
obviously she, again, has done everything right. Um, and I just wanted to ask, kind of jumping back to, not, not cutting this off, we can go back to it, but just uh, jumping back to CUC, how important is it in a seahorse tank with sand to have some sort of sand sifter? I think it's a good idea. Is that coarse sand, is that sand or is that crushed coral? Um, I think it's a mixture. Yeah. Okay. It looks like a mixture. Yeah. I normally recommend a relatively fine sand in a, in a seahorse aquarium. Okay. Um, I don't like going with crushed coral or gravel. And the reason is, is that it's pretty easy for detritus to build up in the substrate that way. And that can be a source for issues. Okay. So and if I, I wanted to switch the sand, how would you recommend me switching it? The easiest way to do it would be to, well, the, the problem is when you add the sand, it's going to cloud the tank. But as far as removing, you can siphon off sections at a time. You don't want to do the whole thing at one time unless you remove the inhabitants out of the tank. If you do right. that, then you can, you know, siphon the majority of it out and then put sand on top. Oh, okay. Um, you know, you don't have to remove 100%, but I would take it down about 75% and then put sand on top. Okay. And Dan, I know your reasoning for suggesting something other than crushed coral, but that's probably not the problem here, right? I mean... Well, I can't say that it's not, but at the same time, I'm not convinced that it is. But what happens, you know, in this case, we have a mixture, so it's not as bad as having just straight crushed coral. But you'd be shocked at what comes out of... Um, a crushed coral or uh, a small gravel uh, bedding when you go to, to shake it up and the amount of organics that build up in there. You know, sure. the organics are able to settle and go in between the, the pieces and it just rots and it's a source, it's a place for things like your anema and other ciliates and bacteria to, to feed on and grow. And that's, that's a fact you can't find many places. So that's, you know, why it's so important that we get this information out there. Other thing, the final thing I've got to, I've got to throw out there and I'm asking you because you know your tank and I know so many people that keep clownfish with seahorses and it works out and it's fine. Uh, but typically long term, it's not fine. So I'm just, have you, have you seen any, um, situation Aggression. where they were bothering the seahorses? No, they they usually don't. And even like when I feed, I usually will feed them first. Okay. Um, so I'll feed them first, and then when I um, I it's not even up, but I have that little dish, mm -hmm. and I usually have it up here. Um, and they when they're eating, they usually don't get near them. Um, and I learned that because in the beginning, when I would feed the seahorses um, in the dish, the the white clownfish would go up there and try to eat it. So I would have to literally sit here. And as long as I sit here, they won't get near them while they're eating. Nice. But now, I've, <laughs> now I've learned that as long as I feed them before I feed the seahorses, I don't really have an issue with them with that. But other than that, they don't really bother them or get near them. They're usually they're, both of those two guys are usually just together on one side or the other side of the tank. <laughs> and they're different species. They're not a mated pair, right? Right, right. Okay. Um, anybody got any thoughts about that? Questions, comments? Not about that specifically. I wanted to mention, though, that she mentioned the feather duster worms mm -hmm. earlier. And those, I have a lot of those in my tank, the little tiny guys that come out of the rock. And I actually consider them part of my cleanup crew. We Me too, good point. <laughs> feeders. Yeah. So they're fine, actually. Yeah. Right? But are, are you talking about the, the worms? Because there's some that they ha they're hard. Yeah, not bristle worms. They're like a white tube with a little blooming flower yeah. at the yes. end. And they wait. Yes. Those are. Um, feather duster worms, I think, or feather worms. And, and they're good. Filter feeders, they they get the bad stuff out of the water column. Oh, okay. All the tiny particles of food and stuff. So I think they're actually a good cleanup crew member. Did somebody tell you that they were bad or you just didn't want to uh, like them? I, I feel like I read it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I, ha I have my reef tank and on the reef tank, I have some of them in there. And it's actually happened a few times when I've cleaned the uh, the seahorse tank where I've actually got scraped from them. Like I, I, I my hand, sure. you know, rubs on them and I get like a little cut. 
And so I thought to myself, could that have been the problem? Like since the seahorses don't have scales, they could have scraped and that's what started it. I, so that's why I thought maybe that was the worms. problem. A bristle worm is like red and it looks like an actual worm worm. Is that yeah, weird? yeah. No, no, uh, no, I'm not talking about those. I can actually probably show you guys. I took the rocks yeah. out. No, go I'm ahead go, go ahead and show us. And I was going to say, I get what you're saying. Holly, she's saying that like as she's cleaning the tank, she's come up against uh -huh. a feather duster and it scraped her. And yeah, the only thing I'm pretty sharp. Yeah. And the only thing I would say to that is there's a huge difference between a feather duster and a hydroid. So. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. They're very, very small. Okay. Let's see. I'm so sorry. Look, we've got it running all over the house. <laughs> it's terrible. Don't be sorry. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, as soon as we cover this, I'm going to ask everybody um, if there's anything them? they go ahead. Okay. Can you guys see those? Yeah. Those are just feather dusters. Uh, no, they're, yeah. oh, gosh, what's the name guys? What's the name of those? There's spinoided worms or something like that. Those are the ones in a reef tank. They'll shoot out their little spinners, spider webs, and they can really affect and hurt coral. So now I'm kind of curious. Those are not yeah, feather so dusters. Usually, uh, what I, what I've heard from other reef uh, people, they call them like, I guess they also because they have a little feather, kind of mm -hmm. like the feather worms, but they're really tiny. Mm -hmm. But if you irritate, if you bother them, they release like a mucus, yep. which can irritate corals or other mates in the tank. Mm -hmm. And now it's driving me crazy. If, if any of my reef friends are still here, tell the name because it's driving me nuts. It's like spinoid <laughs> or something like that. And they literally spinoid a little spider web. And they're terrible. I'm going to find yes. it once we're not live. So that's Mermaid. what I was talking about, the feather, feather dusters. <laughs> what are they, Dan? Mermaid's Reef uh, put oh. a name in there. I don't know how to pronounce it. Okay. The question is, when did you remove that from the tank? I removed it um, after I put um, the first seahorse in the hospital tank the first time. First so when time. I pulled, yeah, so when I pulled him out, I pulled all those rocks out because that's all I could think of. Cause I was thinking like, for, you know, I've had him for over a year, like they've been fine. Like I was trying to figure out what it could be. Um, and when Shara told me it looked like a bacterial infection, all I could think of was like, maybe he scraped himself, he hitched on something and it scratched him. And that's how he that, got the infection. And, right. That would be a reasonable assumption for him, but it doesn't explain what's going on with the others. Right. And so that's why I put the, yeah. So that's why I'm like, I don't know if it is that or not, because now the female has it. Well, you certainly weren't wrong to think that, but I'm, I'm going right. to go with exactly what Dan said. It's probably uh, just something that's in the tank and for whatever. Go, go ahead, Dan. You're going to say something. Sorry. No, no. Uh, go ahead. You're, you're fine. That, that was it. I just was going to say, I'm going with what Dan said. And again, guys, I'll make sure there's a copy of what he covered as far as medications. He's not recommending it, um, but that's what's worked for him in the past. Um, and, you know, in my case too. Um, and I just wanted to say, Mermaid's Reef said, maybe do some sand cleaning and a nice water change. So Dan, because of the fact that uh, after the male looked healed, Obviously, you said you would have taken more time before adding it back to the tank, but as she's now treating the rest of them, um, a lot of people ask after I treat my seahorse, what's what's the uh, what's the method for putting it back into the tank? Isn't whatever caused this problem still in the tank? And now that we talked about vermeted snails, that's the pronunciation. And thank you, Mermaid's Reef. Um, you know, it's, I don't think it's such a bad thing that you're getting rid of those, but I don't think that's the reasoning for your problem. So should she do some huge water changes or I know you recommended probiotics if someone can get them, but is there anything else you want to say about that before reintroducing a seahorse to the tank? Um, you know, the, the thing is, is that a lot of these organisms that give us problems with seahorses are ever present in the tank. And the problem is, is when their numbers get out of hand or in some cases where the seahorses become stressed and stress is a hard thing to sometimes define because it's not always obvious. And so, you know, it could be a case where the first seahorse was stressed by the, uh, whatever the hell you call those organisms on the rock. Remitted snails. Go 
so once he took off with an infection, now that infection can, you know, the, the organisms have become pathogenic and they're, they've more vir virulent, if you will. And so it could have been a chain reaction, if you will, that, that caused what's happening. Sure. Um, it could also be something else entirely. You know, the problem is, is that we don't know. You know, I, I'll be real happy when the DNA sequencing of the water comes readily available to where we can take a water sample and get counts of what's in the water. And once we have a database built up of what's normal, we can then identify what else is in the water and we'll be, we'll be able to become much more accurate in diagnosing and treating when that happens. Absolutely. I see a couple more questions. So my final thing about this, um, because I know Dan's going to work with you on the side uh, and we're just going to pray for you. Cross fingers if you're not a prayer, but um, I know it sucks. Believe me, I've had these problems myself and it sucks and you did everything right. But my final question, Dan, is, uh, and, and this is no uh, this is just my super careful, casualistic <laughs> person that only does snails for cleanup crew. Do you think that the clowns have anything to do with it? Because what I did notice is she has two different species, so they're not paired up. They're not, you know, mates. And that's when, when I, my clownfish got mean and started biting me and turning all evil, it's when they paired up and one became a female. So she obviously doesn't have this circumstance, but would you recommend well, to do anything about clowns? I think they are or? mated. Oh, okay. Sorry. Mated clownfish turn mean. Because, but they haven't been, they haven't been aggressive because the white one, what used to be the same size as the little orange one, and the orange one, the white one got big, and they're always together. So I assume they made it, or they're a pair now, but they're not aggressive at all. Um, I've seen yeah, people and... succeed with clownfish in a seahorse tank. Let me say that off the bat. I've seen people succeed that way, especially in a bigger tank. You're not talking about a little 30 gallon tank. You have a big enough tank, but I was just, I want to let you finish what you were saying and just ask uh, if Dan had any thoughts about that or, or not. Go ahead with what you were saying. Oh, no, I was just saying that I, I think they are made it, but I mean, I could be wrong, um, right. but yeah, they're definitely not aggressive. They don't seem to move very fast, Dan. Do you think that's cool? Yeah, you know, the fact to think that they've in been time what might happen. You, right. The fact that they've been together for so long, right? Um, you know, makes me tend to think that they're probably not the issue. Um, I, I can't say definitively, but I, I would my my opinion would be that probably not. Um, you know, if this is a case where they just introduced and this happened, then I would have a different thought process. Um, you know, I, I, I really don't think that they're the issue. I'm sure. And, and Ray came out and said, you know, I'd hate to see what happens in the future. But again, when you come to Wine Wednesday, you have to remember there are some people that are super duper careful and some people that are willing to take a little risk because they know their fish and their tank. And so I, I don't, I agree with Dan, frankly, in this circumstance, normally I would never say put clownfish with seahorses, but you did successfully for a year and a half. So I don't think that's what all of a sudden caused a problem. So a couple, a couple of notes that I've seen over time in dealing with customers is that generally if you add the seahorses first and then add the clowns, um, or if the clowns are added when they're real, real small, um, it's not as bad typically. And then the other thing is the size of the tank. You know, the larger the tank, the <coughs> easier it is to add other things that may be questionable. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people have, you know, complete success using clownfish in a tank. I've also seen people who um, could not keep seahorses in the same tank as the clowns. So it can go either way, but sure. given the circumstance and the history of this, I don't think clowns are the issue. And just to, to wrap that section up, I just wanted to make clear I had to ask that question because anybody new coming into this, I would advise you not to put clowns, clowns with seahorses. But this lady right here has done everything right. <laughs> she knows her fish. She knows her tank. She's done everything right. And I agree with everything Dan said. Um, and, you know, if you're new, maybe don't do that. But she knows what's up. And this stuff just happens again. And I can't thank you enough for sharing 
because that's what, you know, I try to share when I make huge, you know, you haven't made a mistake. I'm saying it wrong, but I, I try to share when I issue. have a problem <laughs> too, because other people can learn from it. So we can't thank you enough. And your tank is beautiful. I love it. Thank you. So I can't wait till it, till we, till we fix the seahorses and get them back in there. Yes. And please keep us updated on whatever um, you guys figure out. Um, sure. it, thank you for your help. Absolutely. And I hope we do help. Um, just want to cover, we've been going two and a half, almost three hours guys. So I'm going to have to call it soon, but, um, we, we definitely invite you back anytime it stays the same link. So as long as you have that link, you can always jump in whenever you want. And uh, we did have a few more questions. So, um, let's see, I'm sorry. I'm trying to go back through them. Can I use an octagon tank for seahorses? It's a 55 or 50 or 55 gallon tank. I think Ray answered the question properly. Um, okay. A 55 gallon uh, octagon is a much better tank than say a 20 or 30 gallon. Um, the problem with octagon tanks is the shape and getting the flow right. And you know, I see a couple problems. If you have a sump, a lot of those are mitigated, but if you're trying to use hang on the back equipment, it's hard to get all your equipment on the tank uh, because of the shape of the tank. And the flow, the flow pattern in an octagon you know, if they were wider, the wider they are, the easier it is. The taller and narrower they are, the more difficult they are to have the right flow in the tank to keep everything in suspension and to not overpower the tank with flow. Perfect. And guys, when I reread your question, even though it's been answered, it's just because I want to make sure it's part of the video. So apologies that we're repeating ourselves here, but that's why. Um, Courtney asked, how would you re recommend cleaning the sand? Mermaid's Reef said, gravel back or stir a small area before each water change. And then after you do the water change, remove it. I also like the idea that you use cleanup crew for it. Um, because when you have a sand sifting star or the Nasarius snails, they kind of do some of the work for you. Anybody, anybody got anything to add to that? I do. Go ahead. Um, I, I agree with what Mermaid Reef said as far as using a gravel cleaner or sand, you know, one of the cup type uh, siphon things. But I'll tell you this, in a seahorse tank, if you have a uh, large substrate such as gravel or, or uh, crushed coral, you will not be able to keep up even if you use one of those to clean the uh, substrate. Um, gotcha. You're better off going with a, a finer sand than that. That's a great point. And it brings a question I have, Dan, because I have in my display tank, it's about three years old now. And I set it up, it's a combination of crushed coral. And then I bought live sand to top it at the time that it's about a two inch thick bed. Yep. But it sounds like I'd be better off to start removing that and replacing it with sand. So, but that of course is part of my biological filter. So I'm wondering at what rate it would be appropriate for me to start switching it over and removing Great it. Great question. Right, and the, the correct answer to that is it depends. <laughs> and okay. When I say that, it depends upon your bio load it depends mm -hmm. upon how much rock you have, what other biological filtration you have. Mm -hmm. So, if you have adequate bio, if you have adequate rock or, or biological filtration besides the sand, you can uh -huh. do a large, pretty large section at a time. But even if you could do a very large section at a time, I still recommend doing small sections at a time, because uh -huh. not only do you have to worry about the biological, but you also got to worry about what's you know what Beam. you're stirring up into the water column. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I say siphon it out. And instead of using a big cup like they use for the um, gravel cleaning and sand cleaning, yeah, yeah. I would probably take something like a 3H to maybe maybe even a half inch hose and yeah. um, siphon out some of that stuff and then add the sand back in. But when you add the sand in, if you've got animals in the tank, you got to realize that you're going to have a cloudy tank for a day or two until that settles. Yeah. So about how much do you think I should remove it? I do have really good um, 
mechanical filtration, I have a pretty big sump. It's a 30 gallon. So I have a big filter sock. I have a um, skimmer rated for a 240 gallon tank. Woohoo! And I have a third. I followed the rule of about a third of the tank is live rock. So not a huge amount of live rock in there. Yeah. The, 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 how many seahorses in the tank? Currently, I have three. And, and I'm gallons? about to add two, two juveniles. The, the adult seahorses are about eight to nine inches each. So they're pretty big. And the juveniles, I have one that's um, five inches. And I'm waiting till the other one's probably about four inches or so to add those two. So then I'll have a total of five. Before Dan uh, continues, uh, wait, before Dan continues, I need to put a big banner across the screen and say, Holly is a breeder. She's not a newbie. So go on, Dan. How many gallons total? So in the display tank, the tank itself is a 64 gallon and a 30 gallon sump. Okay. If it 94 was me, gallons altogether, right? Right. If it was me, I would take the seahorses out, put them in a bucket with an airline. Okay. I would remove 75% of the uh, substrate. Okay. I would add the new substrate, let it settle, and then put the animals back. Okay. So in Inland Mermaid's um, circumstances, now would be, if she wanted, if she chose to do that, now would be a good time. She's got the clownfish in there. Would that affect the clownfish or? Um, most of the fish can handle the, the, the uh, ugliness of it. But the problem is, is that my biggest concern is when you disturb a sand bed that's been sitting there. Um, yeah. Anaerobic bacteria, can, right? Yeah, there's stuff that can kick up. I would prefer to move stuff and then put it back. So I also have a peppermint shrimp, a uh, mandarin dragon net, and a uh, um, orange spotted goby in there. So should I remove everybody when I do that? If it was me, I would. Now, okay. That's if I'm doing the whole thing at one shot. If I'm doing uh -huh. it in sec small sections, then no. Okay. But so I should remove 75% of it probably all together. I don't have to remove it all at once, like you said, and then it might go a little better. You could. <laughs> The thing okay. is, is that the reason I say 75% is that even though you'll have some of the larger uh, substrate in place, it'll be spread out among the rest of the sand so that it'll be essentially the same as having a hard packed sand bed. Gotcha. So I can leave 25% in and add the sand and I should be okay. You all in be, all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. And just for the record, guys, again, this is risk tolerance yet again. Um, Dan's telling us the best way to do it um, and you know how to fix it if you've done it a different way. But if it's working for you, it's working for you. That's that's kind of how, how I feel about it. How deep sand bed should I end up with? Like how deep should a sand bed be roughly? Inch or two. Okay. Um, you know, there's other people that have very, you know, varying suggestions on that. And I found with most seahorse tanks, an inch or two is fine. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't okay. go any more than that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've played with, you know, different levels in the past. And, you know, my problem is a very light sand bed. I often ended up with bare spots in the tank. So I have a tendency to go beyond an inch. And I don't know where the exact line is to where you develop anaerobic bacteria and problems and whatnot between a deep sand bed and a shallow sand bed. But, well, and I have um, cleaning crew too, so I need to think about them. Right, yeah. and, and Dan, your recommendation, that's not a deep sand bed in any way, shape or form, so you're No, good. no, I'm not saying it's yeah. a deep sand bed, okay. but some people do right. recommend a very shallow sand bed or a very deep. Right, no, you're right. And, and I would just say when we cover flow in the upcoming weeks, we'll talk more, because frankly, in my case, I always do I know people want to have natural looking tanks, but I'm going to, I'm going to freaking post another picture of my macro tank. It looks natural. It's beautiful. It's got colors all over and beautiful seahorses and no sand bare bottom. I'm always going to go bare bottom if I can, because while there are all these benefits to having sand and a substrate, 
you can duplicate that by doing more in the sum. It, you know, so when you get up the flow that seahorses actually like and need, you're, you're into reef tank territory. So if you're in a smaller tank, uh, you're going to have like sand going everywhere if you've got it, in my opinion, in my opinion. Um, obviously, uh, Inland Mermaid has done a great job with her sand and, or her, you know, substrate and it's working. So, you know, it's all about opinion. And let's see, Mermaid's Reef. Right, she was talking about catching them all at the same time. And that is a good question. And just let's let's go back to cleanup crew before we <laughs> shut this down, guys. It's three hours now. Oh, my goodness. Now, folks, uh, got to call my daughter at 11 o'clock. So. Ray, thank you for staying so long. I'm getting ready to good shut night, it down Ray. anyways. <laughs> good night, all. Good night. Good night Ray. Ray doesn't good night. keep cleanup crew anyway, so. Good riddance. No, I'm just kidding, Ray. I love you. <laughs> Anyways, so, um, and, and everybody here has covered what they personally use for cleanup crew. Is there anything that you can say that you absolutely think a seahorse tank, tank should have, whether sand or not, and that every seahorse tank should not have as far as cleanup crew? Um, Marina, I'm going to let you go first. You've been quiet for so long. If, if you come quickly, <laughs> I know you're muted. You might be off like eating or having fun without us. Okay. All right. When Marina gets back, we're going to hear from Marina. But Holly, is there anything that you absolutely say don't put in a seahorse tank as cleanup crew and some, anything that you say you have to have? Well, I mean, there's things you shouldn't, I think. Anything that could hurt them. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's, I think everybody's got different, you know, things that work for them. And as yep. long as it's working, then, you know, it's a good thing for you. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Cheers to that. Uh, Dan, anything that you think absolutely should or shouldn't be a cleanup crew member of a seahorse tank? Uh, in general, stay away from the crabs, both in the tank and on yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like sharks or baby snook or things like that. Um, right. You know, I, I always recommend adding the sardius snails if there's sand in the tank. Mm -hmm. I, I think that they're uh, good because they not only help eat the leftover food, but they also help stir the sand bed. Um, I like herm uh, hermit crabs if the seahorses don't eat them. And yes, seahorses can pick them apart and eat them once they discover they can do that. Uh, uh, I, I really like having a couple peppermint shrimp in the tank because not only will they play cleanup crew, but they will also breed and you have an extra food source when they breed. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the algae eating snails, you know, I don't consider them cleanup crew, but most people will have different algae eating snails in the tank as well. Great. And um, Inland Mermaid, anything that you think absolutely must be a cleanup crew member of a seahorse tank and anything you would absolutely not add? Well, I, I agree with Holly. I think there's a lot of things we shouldn't have in there that might harm them. I think like also, Dan, I, I do like having a lot of snails in there. Um, and with the hermits, I've heard mixed mix feelings with them. Um, after I had already added them, I heard some people didn't like them because they could hurt supposedly the, the seahorses, but I haven't run into those issues yet. Um, but I think snails is the biggest thing. And if you have a sad bed, sand bed, I definitely like the sand sniffing star because it definitely moves the sand around. I, I agree with you. The, the key with the hermits is if you stick with blue legs or um, what do they call them, the scarlet, uh, the little red-legged jobbies. No, you're right. Hermit. Blue leg versus red. Go ahead. You know, what you don't want is one of the hermits, like I've posted a picture before where, it, you know, there's hermits out there that get as big as your fist. Those are mm -hmm. going to go after the seahorses. But, you know, the other thing is, too, whether you have large seahorses or whether you have dwarfs, you know, if you've got really small seahorses and you add hermits, they may go after them when they're resting. Hmm. Absolutely. So, so basically, guys, to wrap this up, <clears throat> if you have specific questions like, can this go in my seahorse tank? You just head on over to Seahorse Sources Group, ask in there, one of us will answer, or come to Wine Wednesday as Inland Mermaid did today. 
we thank you again so much for sharing, even though it's it's not a you know something you're really happy about right now. We'd love that you share because it'll help others for sure. Um, and we want updates for sure, and we welcome you back for any sure. week. Yes, and for cleanup crew in my tanks, you guys you guys know already that I'm a snail chick, and I like the snails, and I avoid anything that could even possibly cause trouble. But I do absolutely keep peppermint shrimp. My motto is when I start up a seahorse tank, I usually, I don't start with cleanup crew, just to be clear. I'll start the seahorse tank, I'll let it go for a minute, then I'll add some snails based on just an average cleanup crew and I can make a list of what I would add if you'd like me to. But then I'll kind of watch the tank and what it does based on my maintenance schedule. So if I start seeing and, and again, I want to point out, go back to the cycling video, you're going to go through an algae phase where you got green, red, possibly brown, algae growing on over everything, and then it all of a sudden goes away. In my opinion, that's not that you can add cleanup crew, but it's going to go through that cycle either way. You can add cleanup crew to speed up the process, but it's going to go through it. So once you're through that, once you're like three to six months into the tank, then if there's a problem, I'll add snails specific to the problem. Or if I see Aptasia, I'll add peppermint shrimp. And as I mentioned earlier, make sure they're hungry before I add them and then not feed the tank until they're, you know, starting to pick at Aptasia. Um, and there's other tricks if you ever want me to, you ever want to talk to me on the side about those with peppermint shrimp. There's nudibranchs. There's all these other things that you can add, but it kind of depends on the situation. Um, so you got to come here to One Wednesday or to Seahorse Sources Group and kind of ask, um, hey, what should I do for this? And we can help you cover it. But I will post that link again to the snails review that I really like. And we will, we will make sure to make a document with what has worked for us in the case of treating um, the bacterial infection uh, tail rot that was covered tonight. And I will share that a little bit later, maybe tomorrow. But guys, it's been three hours. I love you all. This has been Question. amazing. Go ahead, so, Dan. Um, next week, next Wednesday is uh, two days before Christmas. Are you planning on doing a wine Wednesday? Heck yeah. Week? I already said I'm doing a New Year's Eve too, but yes. Well, New Year's Eve makes sense. I'm just questioning whether or not what people's schedules are and stuff just before Christmas. Are you busy? Is that what you're telling me now? No, I'm not saying I am. I'm just questioning <laughs> whether or not we want to do it. And if so, then we just go ahead and put it out there. Okay. Any other thoughts, guys? Are we um, good to go two days before Christmas? Yeah, I, I can do it. Marina? Marina's like, I left you guys an hour ago. I just pretended I was still here. <laughs> All right, fine, Marina. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding if you watch this later. Mwah, I love you. I uh, love all your input. I, I wanted to hear your last final thoughts, but I get it. No problem. Mermaid's Reef's not busy, so that's a yes. We're going to be live okay. next Wednesday. Yeah. Um, do we want to decide a topic real quick? That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Or should I do another poll and actually post the topic earlier than today? <laughs> How about, can we talk about um, plumbing? Ooh, plumbing that is fantastic. Like the fry tubs and tanks yeah. and just plumbing in general. <laughs> All right. There we, Courtney says she'll be watching too. Awesome. And Courtney, join anytime. And Dylan, we love you. Thanks for coming. Come back. And guys, are we, uh, I will continue to, to do polls um, to make sure we're covering the topics that you want to hear. But at, um, I'm saying plumbing sounds fantastic for next week. Everybody good with that? Good. Uh, Dylan suggesting flow. I know. And, and Dylan, we're going to cover flow. I absolutely promise. And don't forget, even if That's we're talking that, I think, I think plumbing for flow is it, you know, it kind of goes together. Yes. But I want, I do well, want to do a specific topic on flow. Um, but, um, you know, and I will continue. Courtney said, plumbing, fry tub, yay, <laughs> I'm with you, because uh, that's a little difficult, but we're going to cover it all, and don't forget that if you come to plumbing, and you have a question about flow, we'll still answer it, and if I ever miss your questions, because I'm yammering on, uh, ask it again, don't be afraid, because we want to cover it, Dan, what were you going to say? No, I, I wasn't going to say anything, I was just sitting there uh, thinking about what was being said, um, I'll try to see what I can find as far as pictures go in terms of plumbing and fry systems. 
And I, to P.S. Dan, I'll get with you on the side because I have Colby is the one that walked me through setting up my fry system, and he sent. I mean, you did too. But I've got all sorts of pictures too, so we can do it together. But okay, so we all cool then? Yes. I'm out yes. of wine. I'm signing off with a Sprite. <laughs> Good times. Good night, Whole bottle. Woo! All right. Okay, guys. All right. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And next week we'll talk plumbing in fry tanks and in regular tanks. I bet Dee and Ryan will be here because they're setting up seahorse tanks as we speak. And they're the high-tech dudes that are going to do it high-tech. So maybe we'll get some input from every which way. It'll be fantastic. But thank you for joining us tonight. Everybody say bye. Goodbye. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Good night with my big Sprite. <laughs> Good night. Cheers. Good night. Oh.